Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 17th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I uh, welcome members, uh, welcome our uh, first panel, who I'll introduce in a moment, and any visitors in the gallery. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent any mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. Right, item uh, one uh, on uh, the agenda this morning. We have two uh, negative instruments to uh, consider. Uh, the first is the uh, late payment of commercial debts, Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-226. Uh, uh, do any, any members have any issues they wish to raise in relation to us? No. Nope. Are we content simply to note that instrument? We agreed. We are content, thank you. Uh, and the second instrument is the Debt Arrangement Scheme uh, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 216. Do any members have any issues they want to raise in relation to that? Uh, nope. Uh, in that case, are we content to note the instrument? Agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. All right, item two uh, on the agenda. We are continuing our inqu inquiry into uh, security of supply, and we have two panels. Uh, joining us this morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our first uh, panel uh, with us. Uh, I should say we did invite um, Amber Rudd, who is the Secretary of State at DEC, uh, to come to the committee. Um, uh, however, Westminster is sitting at the moment with a heavy legislative programme and with a government with a majority of 12. I think it's understandable that uh, the Minister was not able to uh, make the trip to, to, to join us, um, but we have two uh, excellent substitutes. Uh, in the form of uh, John Fines, who's Director of Energy Strategy, at Networks and Markets uh, at DEC, and Dan Monzani, who's Head of Security of Electricity Supply. So thank you both for coming along. Um, we're going to allow about an hour and uh, maybe 10 minutes or so for this uh, session. Um, so I would uh, remind members, as I always do, if they would keep their questions short and to the point, and if we could have answers as short and to the point as possible, that would be helpful in covering some of the topics we'd like to get through in the time available. But before we get into questions, I think, Mr Fines, do you want to just say something by way of introduction to set the scene? Well, th thank you very much. And firstly, thank you for the invitation. This is obviously a very important issue with lots of different elements uh, to it. So it's always valuable uh, to share perspectives uh, on it. And I know you've had a number of good discussions uh, so far. Um, as you said, the Secretary of State, sorry she can't be um, here, but she's certainly been very keen to make early contact with the Scottish uh, government and look forward and looks forward to a positive working uh, relationship um, on the range of issues that we have. Um, you'll understand that it's um, fairly early days for new ministers um, after our election, and I hope you'll bear with me um, if there are areas uh, where you're you know, seeking policy detail, uh, which I don't have uh, today. But I'll obviously do my best uh, to answer the questions that you uh, you do have. Um, on the substance, well, you've had masses of evidence uh, already. Question clearly, how do you maintain and ensure a very high level of uh, security of supply uh, in, a, in an efficient way in order to keep bills uh, down as low uh, as you can do? Um, there's quite a lot of action underway uh, in the short term with National Grid and Ofgem to buy new balancing services. Uh, for the medium term, we have um, the greater investment in networks to ensure connectivity within GB and the operation of the capacity uh, market. Uh, and in the longer term, we have a very active programme of promoting interconnection between GB and other European uh, markets and potentially further afield uh, and work going on in order to ensure that the market signals uh, are such as to make the most efficient answer that we that we can. Uh, we believe we're making uh, good progress, but as I said, this is a very important area um, and we expect it to remain a really key focus for us um, over the coming uh, months and years. So I think with that, I'll probably... Uh, stop and leave as much time as possible um, for your questions and interests. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you, Mr. Fines. C can I maybe just start off um, j just you know, picking up some of the comments you made um, in relation to the, the broader policy agenda? I think we're all aware of the, the, the trilemma that faces uh, 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 policymakers on, on energy balancing, decarbonisation, affordability, and security of supply. Uh, in terms of decarbonisation specifically, where, where is the government now in terms of decarbonisation of the energy mix and, and our, our route towards that? Well, the, um, I think maybe there's two parts to the argument. The first is um, there are some areas where the trilemma actually points in different uh, directions, but that's not universally um, the case. 
uh, and actually this might be worth bringing in um, the interconnection uh, story a little bit here. Um, earlier this year, um, we reached a final investment decision on a, a project that would um, connect the Norwegian electricity market with the GP market um, for the first time. Uh, that's a project being taken forward by National Grid on our side and StatNet on their side, uh, and that's a project which um, is, is a win on all the dimensions uh, of the trilemma, um, because there is a lot of um, hydro generation uh, in Norway, which they're seeking a market um, for. We're an attractive market for that because of our size and, and our prices. Um, and so they're very keen to have the connection. Um, but it also helps us um, stabilise our system and particularly to deal with any um, surges in wind generation that we may have uh, in the future. So you have quite a natural match uh, between the generating um, mixes of the two uh, countries. Uh, and so that order also is projected to bring down uh, consumer bills uh, in this country. So there you have a, a low-carbon um, solution which has a positive element on security of supply um, uh, and, and potentially a bill saving too. So, so there are things like that that you can do. And, um, you know, I would have thought the new government would be interested in seeing whether there's more things like that could happen. Um, and there is another project that goes from Norway to, um, to Peterhead, um, in principle, called North Connect, which again could be quite an interesting part of the future. So, so it, it's wrong to think these things always are as trade offs. Um, uh, more, more broadly, um, on the decarbonisation uh, agenda, um, the Secretary of State will need to be thinking through the, the detail of that and particularly um, what we do in the 2020s. Um, you know, she is very keen in all, in, to make progress on uh, promotion of renewable um, power, but she'll want to think very carefully about the financial commitments that, uh, that she makes and where the financial resources are best directed amongst the range of technologies that may, uh, that may be there. Um, for the time being, there's a bit of time uh, to do that. We believe we made... Uh, good progress through the renewables obligation and the early CFDs, um, which set us extremely uh, well for the, the 2020 uh, milestone on the electricity uh, side. So um, I would expect there to be more work over the next year or so running in the run-up to the spending review that looks at the position in the 2020s uh, and sets a course. Okay, thank you. Well, it's quite helpful just to set the scene. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you and, and good morning. Um, energy and climate change, in terms of priority, um, is, there an, is it an equal priority? Uh, are we looking at ensuring the energy supply, but are we also ensuring that we are meeting our targets in terms of climate change? Which is it? So I'd have to slightly guess where the Secretary of State uh, would be. Um, I expect that she would say that uh, security of electricity supply is is the first thing you have to achieve, because if you don't achieve that, then um, people reasonably asking, you know, what you're doing. And, you know, the decarbonisation is not something which you do accepting an unreliable power supply. So I would have thought that that would be um, the primary objective. Um, you've then got a question about your respective positions of decarbonising and uh, and the pace with which you do that and what that's going to cost. Uh, and there's a series of interesting um, decisions uh, in there. Um, I think it's fair to say that technology is moving extremely fast in some of these uh, areas. And um, I don't think it's any secret that the department has been um, surprised, pleased, but uh, surprised with the pace with which things like um, solar generation PV cells have come down in, in price uh, over time. Um, so there's always a question about the extent to which uh, you are buying the technology that is in front of you now and the extent to which you are waiting and promoting um, research and development in the hope that something better will be there uh, at the time when you, when you need it. And these are exactly the sort of debates I think will, will need to happen in the run-up to the spending review, thinking about, OK, we've got to 2020, but you know, what is the right pace, what is the right mix uh, in the 2020s, um, and how soon actually can some technologies potentially operate, you know, without financial support, because that ultimately is a, um, is a better place uh, to be, where technologies are competing, so to speak, on their own merits uh, and without particular sets of government um, intervention. I'd also say here that um, the operation of the CFD auctions has been quite um, interesting. Uh, 
in as much as we have set previously administrative strike prices for a range of, uh, of technologies, um, and we've been um, pleased to see the strike, uh, the, the prices in the auction uh, clearing at lower levels uh, for those. And so we need to understand you know, what that looks like. But that's another illustration of the fact that um, it's quite hard to know sitting you know, where I sit exactly what the market is going to be uh, doing and offering uh, in future. I hope that helps. Dan, do you want yeah, to come in? I just had a, a sentence or two uh, by way of comparison to the capacity market, where again we had an auction that was technology neutral, and again it cleared well below what we would have forecast, and indeed many independent external advisors uh, and um, commentators would have predicted. So I think that points to another one of those areas where we're trying to optimise rather than choose within the, the trilemma, trying to use competition to make the uh, decarbonisation and security and supply pathways as uh, affordable as possible. Yeah. You can probably see where I'm coming from. You know, it's whether or not we are looking at ensuring that we are trying to ensure uh, make the sort of climate change targets. So to do that, you know, we'll look at what's there in terms of the technologies or what energy supplies we can actually move forward with. Well, with respect to that, is the UK government uh, in the suggestion that they're going to remove the subsidies for onshore wind? Does that not send out a negative message for investors? Mm -hmm. Um, and does that not then um, impact on the A, security of supply, and B, does it not remove the, an aspect of trying to achieve your climate change targets? So um, we believe we're on track for the carbon budgets. We believe we're on track for the electricity uh, element of the 2020 uh, targets. Um, you know, from the security of supply point of view, uh, wind is, is helpful, but of course you're in the security supply context, thinking about the reliable capacity that you can bank on, so to speak, uh, at a time of system stress. Uh, and that's the reason why you derate um, wind in order to make sure that you you don't uh, assume it'll be there if maybe the wind uh, isn't blowing. So um, I, I personally don't think there'd be a major issue from the security of supply point of view um, as the government um, moves forward on its manifesto uh, commitment. Um, you know, But I should say that uh, as I said at the start, this is, um, you know, fairly early days. Uh, uh, we are thinking about this, um, you know, um, uh, back at the shop, uh, and I hope there'll be more details of that uh, soon. Uh, on the impact on uh, on uh, the supply chain and commercial investment, that is absolutely something which is uh, in the minds of ministers, and they'll be factoring that in when they develop uh, the plans that they have to meet their manifesto commitment. You can understand um, the reasoning behind the questions in that you know, we are concerned that if, if the UK government continue to send out that, what I consider to be a negative message, then investors will walk away, um, even though the fact that they've got maybe plans there already, but, and they may just take that hit and say, well, OK, we're just, you know, just going to walk away. So... Yeah. In that respect, then you don't have your security of supply, and, and I understand that you know wind is intermittent. But when it does blow, you get uh, good results in terms of providing we've got the uh, connection to the grid. But I'm just, you know, is the UK government looking at an alternative? And if it is, you know, Hinkley Point, that doesn't come on stream till what 2030. You've got a huge period. Uh, in that sort of uh, between the sort of 2020 to 2030 that will you have that security of supply so i think um uh, you know as i said before the effect on investment confidence is a key is a key consideration um obviously there has been a lot of investment um uh, under both the renewable obligation and now a very good demand for the contract um for difference the contract for difference has been uh developed um, as a product which provides a gain to consumers but also provides a private law contract which is extremely appealing um, to private sector investors. It's, a, it's an instrument they, they recognise and which they, um, we believe they have confidence uh, in. We think that was shown through the response to the so-called FIDR, the Final, in, Final Investment Decision Enabling for Renewables um, project that we had uh, last year where we had a very strong uh, demand uh, from the market. And of course, that is providing a significant pipeline of these projects, um, you know, in the coming uh, years. Um, by setting the levy control framework, which is an envelope of 
um, you know, affordability agree with the uh, Treasury um, up to 2021. Um, you know, we've given um, a, a really uh, strong signal of, um, you know, forward money uh, to developers. We think that's gone down uh, extremely well. I, as far as I know, that's the most positive forward commitment of money that um, uh, in Europe, certainly, I can't think of others that are you know more out there. Um, you know, does there need to be this debate about what happens in the 2020s and the best way of um, allocating scarce financial resources? Absolutely, and that's where the spending review um, comes in. And I'm sure these debates will play out uh, over the coming months. And uh, and I'd expect the Scottish government to be uh, an important uh, player in that. Um, you know, a, 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 as would others. I think this might be a good moment to mention how the capacity work market will work alongside decarbonisation. So you're right to say that uh, well, many forms of uh, low carbon energy, including wind, do, do contribute at some level to security of supply. The way we uh, ensure there's an overall level of security of supply that meets our reliability standard um, is that we uh, work out what that equates to and the number of gigawatts of um, supply we think we'll need to meet peak demand. We then net off four years in advance how much uh, renewable and other low carbon uh, generation will be on the mix. So if you, if you like, whatever the position is with regard to our pathway towards decarbonisation, we take that out of the equation and then buy what remaining capacity is necessary through the capacity auction. So four years ahead, we are taking an assessment of what the uh, generation will be and then making sure that we procure enough capacity to meet the reliability standard. We can then fine tune that one year out again. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, I probably probably understand most of that anyway. But it's this gap that I'm <clears throat> obviously seeing, and you mentioned the sort of 2020s to 2030s. Um, <clears throat> how can you uh, say with any certainty a, we've got the security of supply during that gap? I mean, we've got Long Gannett probably closing maybe earlier than we, we expected. We don't know what's happening at Peterhead yet um, a, uh, with regard to carbon capture. And I'm just wanting to sort of tease out from you, if you can, what what's happening in this gap. Now, I know I know you say you've got a review and there's you know discussions going on, but can you give us any indication what you believe would be the direction of travel for the UK government to meet that gap in the 2020s to 2030s? So, so the UK government has been clear. It does it does want to see uh, new nuclear um, coming forward, um, you know. But I think what I've been trying to uh, uh, expand on a little bit is that there's a number of things that may come in, and it's quite hard to know exactly what those, um, you know, which one will will materialise. So, I talked about Norway that there are also projects um, to potentially connect uh, Iceland up to the GB. Uh, market Iceland is a is a market um, in which uh, power uh, generation is extremely cheap. Um, it, it, connecting it up to the GB market would be an extremely ambitious um, uh, thing to do. Um, you know, but there are some developers who believe that that can be done. Um, there's some difference about what that might uh, cost, uh, but at its most op optimistic, people think that could come in uh, and be quite a competitive. Uh, offering uh, and quite a reliable offering uh, as well. Um, there are some people who think that the cost of uh, uh, photovoltaic um, in combination with uh, with storage may also drop to the point where that becomes uh, cost competitive. Um, question: How much do you, you know, bank on that? Uh, and you've got the carbon capture and storage um, competition going on uh, at the moment, uh, and the number of others interested in that uh, worldwide uh, too. Uh, so you may find that, um, you know, CCS, um, you know, the costs come down, that becomes uh, an attractive thing to do. And that then also um, potentially helps more with your security supply uh, issue than, uh, you know, things like wind, uh, you know, but the proof of the pudding there will be in, well, how reliable are these things to operate? And, you know, I, I wouldn't like to say, uh, you know, what the right derating factor for a uh, for, for Peter Head's um, CCS uh, project uh, would be if they win the, the money through the competition. Uh, and then ultimately you have the potential to have more gas-fired power station. We have a lot of uh, new gas um, uh, projects that are um, that have planning permission to proceed. Um, you know, those are primarily 
uh, closer to demand, um, you know, but in a highly networked uh, GB system, they would also provide security supply to Scotland as they do uh, to all parts of uh, of GB. So there's a, you know, from the security supply point of view, there's a number of um, uh, there's a number of ways those those could be met, um, and uh, you know, as I said before, there will be this uh, this debate about to what extent do you want to be you know, locking in one particular uh, solution or a range of particular solutions, and how much uh, you're prepared to uh, to spend to do that. Uh, of course, part of that um, argument depends on what view you take of um, of fossil fuel uh, prices uh, as well. And if you're someone who thinks that fossil fuel prices are going to be um, you know, high, then uh, renewables particularly look increasingly uh, cost-effective, uh, marginally uh, speaking. Um, you know, but if you're someone who believes that they're they're going to be um, lower, then that may take may give you a different view of, of where the best thing uh, to go is. Uh, and and obviously we are uh, you know working very hard you know with the Scottish government as well um, in setting up the oil and gas authority in order to maximise recovery of. Uh, of oil and gas uh, as well, so um, you know you can see from that we're not taking a particular view um, uh, of of where fossil fuel prices uh, may be. Thank you. Can you, right. yeah, Thank you. Go on, go on. Um, I'll bring in um, Gordon McDonald who's got a quick follow up on this. Yeah. <clears throat> Just a very quick question uh, on Dennis Robertson's earlier comments about the UK government's intention to end onshore wind subsidies. Um, Currently, Scotland's got 37 onshore wind projects of 50 megawatts or above awaiting the go-ahead. Um, how will this announcement uh, affect uh, these projects? And more importantly, you talked about investor confidence. Bearing in mind that these 37 projects will have borne substantial cost to get to the point they're at, what kind of message does that actually send out to, to people wanting to invest in renewable technology? Well, it it'll depend on the details of the uh, announcement that are made, and when uh, previously in the previous Parliament the government made changes to renewables obligation, it carefully considered the grace periods uh, that were applicable to projects in order to strike the right balance between uh, cost effectiveness for the consumer and to keep uh, you know value for money, um, you know, but also recognising the expectations of uh, of these developers, and these are exactly the issues that uh, ministers are are thinking very carefully about um, now uh, you know equally this is a manifesto commitment so the direction of travel I think is is quite clear but I need to ask you to, to wait until we see a little bit more uh, you know the direction of travel of the actual announcement yeah just just on that point of value for money uh, there was a press release came out from Ian Marchant chairman of Infinis Energy and it says the proposed approach contradicts the government's manifesto commitment to and I quote meet our climate change commitments, cutting carbon emissions as cheaply as possible to save money, end quote. As the cost of substituting more expensive alternative technologies in place of onshore wind would needlessly add several hundred million pounds every year to energy bills. Uh, How does that value for money? Uh, uh, so we, we believe that we are uh, on track to meet the electricity component of the 2020 renewables uh, target um, for 2030. There is a, a European target which does not specify the renewables content. So there's choice for member states about you know how they break that down uh, between the different uh, sectors. Um, and so it's possible then to have a, a discussion about the you know the right investment mix in the 2020s to position yourselves uh, for the long term um, and. You know that there is a, a second point to this, which is at what point, or maybe two more points, at what point does um, a renewable technology um, you get to the point where it no longer needs financial support uh, from the energy bill payer um, in order to um, deploy? Uh, and the third point is um, that, of course, as well as a, a carbon impact, um, these schemes potentially have a, a, a visual and a, and a broader environmental uh, impact, which... Um, this government believes needs to be uh, taken into account. But going back to where I started, I think um, you'll need to wait and see if you could uh, bear with it uh, the detail of what ministers are going to say on these points, uh, which I expect shortly. Just, just so we're clear, Mr. Fines, do we know when an announcement is likely to be made? Uh, I, I don't know, I'm afraid. Right, okay, thanks. 
Okay, I've got a brief follow-up from, from Jack Worthy, and we need to move on. Yeah. Just to, briefly coming back to the issue of Norway and Iceland, um, I'm not against foreign investment, but uh, clearly in this situation where we have effectively a monopoly uh, in terms of system operation, why would we look at that alternative investment, which has cost implications, currency implications, and then balance of payments implications, political implications, management implications, why are we looking at investment there as opposed to uh, developing further uh, capacity, and clearly we're talking about hydro, uh, in Scotland? So um, it, it really comes down to the uh, economics of the thing. But I've just laid this out. That people haven't? I've laid out some of these in terms yes, of Yes, exactly. So um, uh, the, the price differential between the Norwegian power prices and the UK power prices um, means that it's possible to import hydro um, at UK market prices with no need for additional um, financial support. Uh, you know, it's a very large bit of infrastructure which is paid for um, on the arbitrage between the two uh, markets. Um, so that's maybe the first point to make. The second point is, well, why is there not more... Um, hydro development going on inside GB because there are companies that say we have these great schemes and they would really help stabilise the grid and, and so on and so Correct. forth. Um, uh, I might ask Dan to comment in a moment about the operation of the um, the capacity mechanism um, on this, but my understanding is that these projects are eligible for 15-year um, contracts. The capacity mechanism is technology neutral so that if um, uh, if a project offers value for security of supply uh, and is the best value of achieving that aim, and it's a hydro, you know, pump storage project, then it should be perfectly able to uh, to win. Um, if it doesn't wish to compete in the capacity uh, mechanism, um, it's perfectly possible for them to seek an agreement uh, with National Grid to provide balancing services because one of the advantages of pumped hydro is it's a very fast uh, response. Um, it's also conceivable that they could um, support the investment by um, providing, so to speak, insurance for people who are playing in the capacity market but who face the penalties if their project is not available uh, at a particular time because those penalties are designed to be um, you know, a strong encouragement for people to be there at times of, uh, of system stress. Um, so, so there's a number of potential ways in which these projects could, um, could proceed. Uh, you know, why are they not? Um, now, it may be that there is, um, you know, something else going on um, that is preventing them from coming forward. Maybe there's some other market failure we haven't, um, I haven't described um, so far. Um, or it may be that these projects, although they are great pieces of engineering, actually are not the most cost-effective ways um, of ensuring uh, security of supply. Um, you know, but that's the debate that, that we need to have. Um, you know, pe people come and talk to us about these projects, and we are thinking about... Um, or you know the, the the market incentives for storage to see whether um, there is something that we've missed that we need to be bringing forward because don't get me wrong if if there's a um, if there's a bit of technology that can allow us to achieve the uh, security carbon and cost implications with better you know more efficiency I'm all for it um, but the question is you know what is that thing? But it's easier to invest in Norway, isn't it? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say they're alternatives, actually. I mean, um, you know, probably um, what what Norway does is, if anything, it displaces thermal generation in this country because it'll be largely Im importing on a baseload basis. The uh, If you're thinking about pumped hydro, that is a technology that gets used, you know, for particular instances of, you know, sudden urgent surges in demand. Um, uh, and, and so that is used from time to time. Uh, now, you'd never be able to pay for the Norwegian um, infrastructure, the connector between us and Norway, if it was only being used you know, at times of extreme system stress. It, it, you know, the arbitrage only works if it's a consistent trade, and that's because there's a systematic difference between the prices. So, so the Norwegian hydro is in a different part of the market from the 
the possibility of, of UK hydro. So I certainly wouldn't see those uh, as um, as competitors. But Dan, do you want to add anything about hydro and the capacity mechanism? Certainly your description is exactly right. I mean, what we do in the capacity market is uh, a couple of things. One is we try to allow technologies to compete against each other so we can find out exactly which is the most economic at delivering capacity. Um, and uh, obviously... Um, we are talking here about capacity at peak, and therefore those uh, there are some interesting technologies uh, like hydro, like interconnection, like demand-side response as well, which I wanted to mention, uh, which have the potential to very cost-effectively meet those peak demands for, um, uh, for periods. The second element of the capacity market design, as well as technological neutrality, which I think is really important here, is the way it's been designed to, to mirror the uh, electricity-only market, so that, as John says, you can earn revenues elsewhere... Um, for example, through arbitrage or through selling base load power, uh, which hopefully contains some elements of uh, remuneration for your capital costs, and therefore pushes down the additional costs that energy bill payers have to play, uh, have to pay. Sorry, to um, uh, to provide that capacity. So the, those two combined I mean we're trying to drive out the lowest cost for consumer for delivering capacity at peak. Right, okay. we, uh, I'm, I'm conscious of number of members want to come in, but I'm, I'm also conscious of the time and, and we've got a number of topics we want to cover. So I'll bring other members back in later. I'm going to move on, though, uh, to Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to start with the, the supply side, and I know other colleagues will, will, will pick up the demand side. <coughs> the supply side in GB is dominated by a small number of really quite powerful <coughs> privatised corporations. Does the government feel that it has the leverage it needs uh, in dealing with those uh, uh, major players, and uh, if so, what, what is that leverage? How, how, how does government use the mechanisms you've been discussing to s achieve shifts in priority by companies which um, are, are, are large corporations in their own right? If I could start with the micro and then perhaps possibly pass, pass talk more generally about that. Um, again, within the capacity market, I mean, for a start, about 70% of uh, generation is... Big, is big six, as you say, but 30% is independence. One of the things that was very important to us in the capacity market was making sure that when new build was developed, it wasn't completely uh, um, impossible for the big six to develop on balance sheet, nor was it impossible for independence to bring forward new projects. And what we found uh, was, I think, nine new build CCGTs pre-qualifying for the last auction of which seven were from independence. So we were quite pleased in the design of the auction that we had allowed independence to enter and compete through uh, pr a project finance basis uh, against the big six, who presumably are making use of their balance sheet and the strengths that you identify. Um, but John, I don't know if you want to talk more generally. Mr. Manzano, just make a small point. If you're using acronyms, it's very helpful for the, the point of view of the, the official reporters, if, if at least in the first instance you spell out uh, what, what you're referring to. Sorry. CCGT is a combined cycle gas turbine. Yeah, gas thank turbine. You. <laughs> so, um, uh, a few remarks uh, on that. The first is that the UK market actually is not very concentrated by European uh, standards. Um, and as Dan says, there's a significant amount of independent, uh, particularly generation, uh, that uh, exists. Um, of course, we have got the Competition and Markets Authority. Uh, investigation going on now to see if they consider there's any uh, adverse effects on competition. Um, they put out an, uh, an updated issue statement earlier uh, in the year. Um, they are an independent process and I have no special insight into where they will go, but um, reading that it seemed to me that they were mainly talking about, I mean they were not exclusively talking about, but they were mainly talking about um, the retail end uh, of the electricity and gas uh, markets. Um, you know, there are some elements about locational pricing and so forth, but those are sort of market design upstream rather than the point that, that you're getting at. Um, uh, you know, as Dan said, we are seeking to frame policy in a way which allows uh, independence to come in. That's partly on the generation um, side. We, we think, by the way, the, the contract for difference is also good for independent uh, generators. Uh, and on the networks uh, side, um, we have a, a regime of competing the offshore links that we have um, and we are looking to um, with Offgem see whether we can introduce more competition for onshore assets uh, which we believe will keep National Grid uh, on their toes. Um, the use of the auctions um, you know we think is a is a very powerful way um, 
to drive value and uh, and make sure that we don't end up with you know control being exercised by one or more um, players. That's partly CFD and partly capacity um, mechanism. Um, uh, Dan might want to talk a bit a bit more about the the extent to which the capacity mechanism um, has brought forward things that we wouldn't have thought of immediately, such as um, really small scale gas generation that is operated uh, in effect as a virtual power station. That could be something that's quite interesting to to Scotland uh, in time as well. I and mean, one of the characteristics of the Scottish system at the moment is that there's uh, a small number of quite large chunks of thermal uh, generation. And of course, if you've got a large chunk, um, you know, and it does sh shut, then there's always the question about, you know, what does that mean? Um, as it happens, we, we think that Scotland is very well provided for generation. And with the investment we've made in transmission, we think you're pretty well placed. But, but of course, the transmission pricing also changes when one of these large chunks uh, comes off, uh, and so it may be that you, you know um, you know a power station shuts. That means that transmission pricing in a particular area drops very significantly, and then there's a response. You know either with the investment of potentially new new hydro, um, if that was what keeping what was keeping it back uh, previously, or potentially some of these smaller scale thermal generation that helped to to fill that gap. And it's quite an organic uh, system. Um, uh, potentially. That there's one other point I might just um, uh, mention, which is uh, to do with National Grid's uh, role as system operator, because of course National Grid you know, has a fully merchant arm, which is you know, doing some interconnection business and various other things. It has a, a, a regulated um, arm for the, for the transmission regime, and it has this system operator uh, role, which is you know, much more akin to a public policy um, function. Um, and there has been um, quite a lot of debate about uh, whether we have the right um, separation uh, within National Grid uh, about that. Um, on the one hand, they have a lot of skills and strengths, uh, and they're a very professional body. I believe you had Mike Calview um, you know, here uh, previously, and he certainly knows his um, stuff. Um, and they have already taken action to strengthen the, the separation within National Grid uh, in order to give confidence that... Um, you know, this is done in a way which doesn't isn't affected by the broader commercial um, incentives. But you may or may not have also picked up that this is an issue that Ofgem um, is thinking about um, because um, through one of their projects they are um, strengthening the planning and delivery role of the uh, of the transmission and system operator. Um, you know, we're hoping to get this onshore competition uh, you know going, and and maybe in future if what you end up with is a system with uh, more storage and more demand side response and less wire um, you know then you know you could imagine that the the potential conflicts of interest between that and the system planning role become, could become more um, stark um, I think national grid themselves uh, realize that and recognize that and I think they are thinking about what they can do in response to that I personally don't uh, don't worry about um, you know how they're operating. Uh, at the moment, in fact, when they when they first provided the advice to us on the capacity mechanism, um, you know, our view was that they were slightly understating, or very understating, of the potential benefit of interconnectors to system security in in GB. And if if their merchant arm, so to speak, was influencing their advisory arm, you'd expect the opposite uh, uh, to be happening. So I think they've been a bit whiter than white. Um, and actually, further work has shown, has borne out, actually, that there is a more positive contribution to security of supply from from interconnectors, but you know that is a that is an issue. That, you know that should we have an independent system operator? Some places in the world, uh, you know, do uh, you know uh, that might position ourselves for it. Meanwhile, there's a another debate going on. Should you have a system architect in here? Uh, you know, some very eminent engineers are saying, look, uh, the electricity system is changing by historic standards very rapidly. Um, uh, you know, a lot of new stuff is coming on in great volumes. Um, you know, we've always had a predict and a predict and product, I can't talk a predict and provide model. Um, is that really where it needs to be over the long term? And can we can we be sure that it will remain secure and and represent value for money? And I think that is also a fair question, you know, to be asking. And I think you've had some debate about that in this committee uh, as well. But we have no particular view at this stage. Okay. I, one one of the other witnesses we heard from recently was Malcolm Kay, who. Um, made the point in relation to the capacity market that there was nothing in it to optimise a particular mix of investment in different uh, types of supply or also or, uh, or, or to 
um, ensure a, a right balance between supply investment and demand investment. So one of the, and I think yourself, you yourself described it as uh, technology neutral, um, which and, and, and not on, not by accident, but but intentionally. So wh what a consequence of that is that a lot of the actual contracts let under uh, under the capacity market are to thermal generators in order to provide our reserve or or, or, or or backup supply. Is there something that can be done with the capacity market mechanism to incentivize new technologies, whether renewable technologies or new technologies, low-carbon low technologies, uh, particularly looking ahead to the 2020s? To talk through, because absolutely that is part of the, uh, of the intended future. Um, Dan will talk about that in a moment. I mean, in general, I'd say not purely about the capacity uh, market. The sort of questions I would say we need to be asking ourselves are, you know, are we sure that there are no barriers for these things coming forward that we haven't seen, and maybe barriers that we ourselves have put in the way? Um, you know, because it may be that there is plenty of demand side response out there, but there's some there's something in the way we've done the licensing or something else that prevents it, and that that would be. Uh, therefore, a daft thing uh, to be doing. So, we, you know, is there a barrier? The secondly, uh, is there a, is there the right set of market signals allowing people to take these uh, decisions? We're we're on the we're rolling out smart meters at the moment, uh, and there's quite a lot more of that um, uh, to come. If you're a very large user of electricity at the moment, then you're quite aware of what the price is when you use it. But if you're a medium size or a small one, uh, you know, then you aren't. Um, you know, but if you haven't got the information about usage at particular times, then it's quite hard to see how you would be able to secure the value, um, which could actually help everybody. One of those things, as I talked about at the start, that could be a, a carbon and a security and a, um, and a cost effectiveness uh, gain, uh, potentially. But there's also a huge amount of R&D that's going on uh, in this area. Um, uh, Ofgem has had a, a scheme, the low carbon networks um, scheme under the previous regulatory uh, settlement. They have um, some more arrangements going on uh, now, but it's not only actually the network and uh, energy companies who are doing it. You can see quite a lot of interest uh, you know, from companies such as Google uh, in developing technologies that might be able to run over the top of these other things and, and provide people with services that they really, they really want. So again, this is an area which I would have thought um, you know, ought to be a a very live area of, of debate and particularly important uh, for Scotland because of the development of renewables that you have. And I, I was interested to read the discussion you had with um, the representative of WWF, um, you know, because the question, you know, could you run a system entirely renewables is something, you know, where this sort of response, I think, becomes very important. So if this is an area that you're interested in. Um, I think that'll be that'll be something there could be a lot of cooperation on. Just passing over to Dan now about the capacity mechanism in particular. So the capacity market is, um, to take your question about how it can uh, make sure low carbon uh, is taken as part of the mix as well, the capacity market is focused on the prime objective of making sure we meet the reliability standards so that we keep the lights on. That's, that's its, its sole focus. Um, that doesn't mean it's not compatible with our uh, decarbonisation objectives, but principally we achieve the decarbonisation, increasing decarbonisation of the base load through mechanisms like the CFD, which... Uh, bring forward things like offshore wind and so forth and nuclear to uh, displace ageing uh, plants. It, it's also true that we uh, have differential environmental costs in the energy-only market. So, for example, a coal plant will typically pay, pay, uh, well, it'll pay for the price of the carbon it emits, which is roughly double what a gas plant would pay. That means when it comes to compete in the capacity market, those costs are reflected in the bids it's able to make. And so, to some extent, the capacity market reflects the broader environmental measures that are affecting the whole the wholesale market. Um, but we have to keep it focused primarily on delivering security of supply, albeit at the cost of those bidding in, uh, and therefore the, the, the merit order of those who, who win and lose will be affected by broader environmental legislation. Um, in, in that world, we're increasingly decarbonising uh, the, the base load. Uh, there's a very, a very interesting space, which we've talked a lot about today, for... Uh, a mixture of different technologies, some of which will contribute to that low carbon base load. Others will be specialists in dealing with peaking demand. So they will um, typically, therefore, not compete with uh, the low carbon base load, which will have very low marginal costs. 
uh, and therefore will run much of the time, uh, but might be really specialist at being able to respond flexibly or um, uh, at reasonable cost at uh, times of high demand. Uh, and as, as John said, there's a uh, it's quite an interesting dynamic within the, the capacity market in bringing forward both competition between technologies we know and expect and innovation. And uh, I will be honest with you, I did not expect to see um, uh, large numbers of small-scale uh, gas plant that are networked together in cases coming together that are very efficient at meeting just those peak periods of demand uh, and that's quite an interesting picture of, um, uh, of the market where you've got a low carbon base load and some specialists dealing with the peaking that could equally well be served by demand side response mm -hmm. interconnection uh, storage the pump storage at that um, you are specifically what more we can do, and we're certainly not complacent. I mean, it's, you know, we, we're trying to be technologically neutral, but that doesn't mean we don't spend a lot of time with each of indiv the individual technology companies trying to understand what barriers they're finding. And one of the things we're doing for the demand side response sector is, uh, uh, is to respond to their feedback that they would be able to compete most effectively one year in advance of the delivery year, uh, rather than four years uh, ahead. Um, so what we're doing is we're running essentially two prototypical transitional arrangements auctions, which are one year ahead auctions for capacity uh, in 2016-17 and 2017-18, exclusively for demand side response. So that those, uh, those companies can compete, uh, can build their business model, increase their efficiency in time to compete against all technologies uh, in the 2017 auction at T-1. So expect to announce the, announce the parameters for the first of those transitional arrangements auctions in the next few weeks. Uh, and we look forward to seeing a, a liquid auction coming forward on that basis. Now, I, I know Patrick Harvey was keen to follow up some of these questions on demand side response. Thanks, convener. Good morning. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it, it links in fairly, fairly smoothly from what you've been talking about there. The um, the emphasis that we've had that needs to be there on on demand side response, both reducing overall demand and a more sophisticated approach to managing demand, it seems to me requires a, a long-term transformation uh, of a whole host of, of uh, areas of our, of our lives and our economy. Um, you talked about the 15-year contracts that are available for supply through the, the capacity market. Why don't we have that long-term uh, approach to the demand side? I mean, I'm a, you, you talked about the, this, this one-year uh, auction. Uh, we'll all be interested to see what happens out of that, but there doesn't seem to be the same long-term commitment to ensuring that uh, that projects can deliver uh, a really substantial uh, uh, agenda of, of transformation. We started from the position where everyone should have one-year contracts uh, and that you'd have a, an auction every year, and we moved away from that position uh, only in those areas where we thought that the capital requirements of particular projects were such that you would need to be able to amortise those capital costs over a longer time span. And so we introduced three-year arrangements for those who had uh, refurbishing capital investments above a threshold and 15-year uh, contracts for those who have new build projects with a high level of capex. Um, we continue to engage with the demand-side response sector, but they have not pre presented us with evidence of a large capital requirement that is equivalent to something like the uh, a new build power station or a new but, build um, storage. But situation. surely the, the capital requirements for, for example, a, a local authority to transform its, its housing stock right. would be greater than the capital requirements for one of the small uh, gas stations that you mentioned a moment ago. Right. Well, I mean, there's two different things which you identified in your opening remarks, actually, between lowering, uh, lowering the overall demand at all times, energy efficiency, and managing the demand at peak. And what we're focused on in, in security of supply is making sure we can meet that peak demand because that's when it's most difficult to keep the lights on. So it, it may well be that if you look at a, uh, a cost per unit of government objective, if you like, that it, uh, energy efficiency in the housing stock is a, is a very efficient measure. It's an area I've worked on myself and, uh, and I know that to be, to be the case. Um, but it doesn't necessarily deliver you uh, very much um, capacity or reduced capacity need at peak demand because the bulk of its benefit is reduced carbon emissions, reduced energy bill costs uh, at all times of the day. And so we've just got to be careful that we're talking about uh, you know, buying uh, different things. Um, and so it's really on the demand side response I was talking about in terms of the capital requirements because that is where we, we have a really exciting opportunity to uh, flex our requirements at peak demand. 
And I was also interested in the uh, level of coherence there can be between uh, what we would describe as, as devolved responsibilities in Scotland, but yeah. for the rest of, or for, for the bulk of, uh, of the, the, the GB uh, picture, one government has, has responsibility for. Um, over the previous years, um, I was involved in trying to persuade the Scottish government to do more on energy efficiency, and mm. one of the problems they kept coming up against was uh, that they would risk losing some of the, the money that the energy companies have to put in. That's defined at UK level, uh, and so that might end up being spent somewhere other than Scotland, so we wouldn't get more bang for the buck for putting in extra public funding. Now, that's hopefully going to be resolved under the Smith proposals. Some of the, 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 the issues there will be handed to, to the Scottish government. But surely we're, we're still in this position, particularly when we start looking at uh, housing policy, when we start looking at there's more electrification of transport, devolved transport policy, that more sophisticated demand-side response is still going to be split between two governments. Uh, is, there, is there going to be a difficulty that we continue to encounter uh, that replicates that problem with the energy company obligations in the rest of that demand-side response agenda? I'll, I'll let John talk to the devolution picture in a second, but I, mean, I think it's worth reflecting the benefits that we can also get from dealing with uh, security supply at a whole system level. Uh, so Scotland has a peak demand of around, I think, 5.4 gigawatts. The whole of Great Britain is of the order of about 10 times that, about 54, 53, 54 gigawatts. And within a larger system, you've got scale, you've got more diversity. Uh, you're able to manage, therefore, um, uh, higher levels of intermittent uh, um, generation. And so there, there are big benefits there. Um, indeed, it's the same argument we're uh, making about our increased interconnection with some of the other countries like Norway. Uh, and Iceland that John talked to, which could help both specifically Scotland and GB more, more generally. So there are really big benefits from managing a, a, a system uh, at a, a slightly larger scale. Um, but there are, there, there are also, GB, obviously, there's a sort of subsidiary point on various points about what might be best dealt with at a more, uh, more regional or national level. It's, it's a really interesting question, actually. And um, uh, I'm not sure I know for certain what the answer is. Um, it seems to me that we've ended up through the Smith Commission with quite a good balance that brings the the levers over energy efficiency more into line where building regs and local authorities are, and I think there's tremendous potential uh, in there. Um, there's a sort of no detriment element to that to the other parts of GB um, too. Um, during the Smith process, um, I wasn't aware, certainly people didn't talk to my team and I, as far as I know, about the links between that and transport and um, and heat, just thinking it through uh, on the spot. Um, uh, at the moment, the heat and the electricity systems are more separate. They probably will converge, mm. but it's quite a long time frame um, for that. Uh, in the first instance, what I'd expect to happen is for, um, you know, energy to flow from the power system into the heat system. So if you have times of very low uh, wholesale prices, uh, then using uh, using that power for space or water heating is a very efficient mm -hmm. way because it keeps that useful, it keeps energy in a useful form for you know later in the day or for tomorrow or whatever. Um, and those should be possible to come through, um, you know, simply based on the diff on the power price differentials at different times uh, of day, so you know there'll be an opportunity for all sorts of people, whether they're local well, individuals or local communities or the Scottish government, to think about what is their solution on heat going to be uh, in future. And given what we can see about the changing dynamics in the power sector, do you want to be positioning yourselves to take advantage of those things? But I'm not sure there's a. Um, can I can I explore mm, an example? Please, maybe? yeah. Um, Let's assume that we're in a, in a point where uh, there is a longer-term commitment to demand-side response. Um, so, you know, uh, longer-term contracts can be available for those kind of projects. Uh, we've also uh, moved into a period where there's much higher level of electrification of transport, and a Scottish government in future decides that the the, the most efficient and most value for money demand-side response uh, policy it can propose is around transport planning. Mm -hmm. is around the design of transport infrastructure. Now, that's currently supposed to be funded by the Scottish government from within its resources. Would it be possible 
within this capacity market for a bid to be made to, to ensure that that funding comes from the energy system, from the, the, from the GB capacity market, rather than from devolved Scottish resources. So, so we, we, have, we have a... Um, well, do, do you know the answer this is already done? Yes, or? essentially. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, so you have to, to, be, to bid into the, um, the capacity market, you have to be a capacity market unit, which is either a generator or someone who can reduce demand, um, mm. not one of the ancillary services that supports those. So not, neither could you bid a transport network in than you could, a, for example, an electricity network. But it could well be that, of course, some of those costs flow around the system in different ways, that if you have, for example, um, some technology that take, makes use of the batteries in electric vehicles and that's embedded in your transport system, that in some way that is able to um, lower demand at peak times, either by uh, stopping batteries from charging or by drawing on the stored energy there, um, that, that that capacity can be bid, bid into the capacity market. Similarly, actually, one of the potential advantages of um, electric vehicles is that uh, they can charge during the night. And if you have a system with a lot of um, uh, renewables on them, the wind can be blowing at a time when you actually don't want the energy. And so uh, the ability to, to draw off some of that energy at the right times is potentially in the future as important as not having a demand uh, at, at peak. And so uh, that would be something that uh, would allow that to be profitable within the energy market. Um, and, it, and as I mentioned before, also be able to compete uh, as a capacity market unit into the capacity market. So, so it's, it sounds like the answer is is yes. Uh, uh, and and it, and if the if the security supply benefits in there can be captured, then there may still be a question of mm. well, to what extent is is taxpayers' money put in to secure other benefits mm. uh, as well. But you know, w w if the, if those particular thoughts start coming out in more in more detail, I think it'll be well worth a more detailed conversation about them. I'm I'm just keen that we don't end up if the current constitutional situation pertains, I'm just concerned that we don't end up reproducing this problem of knowing that we can do more in Scotland but finding it impossible just because the, the, the two systems don't fit together properly. And of course in any separation systems dialogue is going to be really important and working closely with Scottish government officials so we can work through these things jointly is an important part of the way we try and work. Time for one. Because we are getting, getting time. Just, yeah. just briefly on a, on a, a slightly broader question than, <laughs> than just the demand side. Um, the, the, the subject of the inquiry is, is security of supply, and I'm just wondering whether you would reflect on some of the arguments that we've heard from other witnesses that uh, if we uh, are in a position where we're seeing more distributed generation, more distributed storage, more interconnection, uh, uh, as well as the demand side response, is security of supply the right concept to be talking about? Uh, does it does the, the link between where generation happens and where consumption happens uh, just become less relevant in that? In so, that new so I system? think yeah. So uh, it, it's shorthand, right? So you know, what we're really talking about is are people getting the energy services yeah. that allow them to go about their business and do their things as they want to reliably? That that's what we're trying to capture. But you're you're right. There's a, there's a there's a little bit of a hangover of where it's come from, which is well, the, the you know the, the solution to security is supply, yes. uh, you know, and and that's absolutely not actually where policy uh, is. So maybe we should reflect on whether we have the right term for that. But security supply has a lot of uh, currency, so to speak, uh, at the moment. But the policy absolutely um, supports the full range of responses you've been talking about. Okay. Okay. Um, I think Joanne Lament had some questions around the similar area. On sorry. It's really just. One of the suggestions has been, and I suppose it's a matter of policy between Scottish Government and UK Government, that um, the security of supply debate creates an uncertainty, which means it's less likely that people will move to a fully renewable um, sort of means of, 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 of getting energy. And I wonder whether that is reflected in, in the discussions that you have. But certainly one witness put it to us was that it gave... To keep talking about security supply almost creates a circumstance where it's less likely that people are going to invest in renewables, less likely that you're going to have confidence and take the risk of, of developing those technologies fully. Um, and I wonder whether you, you think that that is the case. And secondly, is it complicated by the fact that clearly um, UK-level nuclear 
energy is seen as a reasonable way of, of helping with security supply, whereas in Scotland that's not the case. Well, if I take that comms point first, I think, if I may, that's an extremely important point. Um, I think we win half the battle by actually securing the system and the other half by making sure people believe we're going to secure the system. Uh, and that is both in terms of building confidence that we can manage a transition to uh, a low carbon future, but also confidence for business to make investment decisions, confident in the knowledge that they will have the supply of energy that they need. And uh, so we spent a bit of time uh, talking with business stakeholders, for example, trying to, um, and with journalists, of course, but trying to make sure that they understand the steps we're taking. They know we've got a plan. They know we used it last winter and it worked effectively to maintain uh, adequate security margins to meet our uh, security standard, that we have the same plan in place now, the fact that we've acted somewhat earlier this, this winter in preparation for this winter. So we spend a lot of time with business stakeholders in particular, making sure that they understand those messages. But you're right, uh, you can get um, a response to talking about security of supply in the media that implies that we're minutes away from, from blackouts, which we, we certainly aren't, and uh, it is something we spend an awful lot of time making sure we are no, we're not getting near that point at all, and we're absolutely maintaining an adequate security standard across the whole of Great Britain. Um, just, just to add to that, I mean, this is an area where the challenge has got more complicated uh, over the last few years, and this is, it's partly to do with coal prices being very low and what that means when coal plant has to come off the system progressively because of European legislation, which creates a cliff edge. It's partly that the the power mix is changing, so if you're a gas-fired power station and before you would have run pretty consistently and you're in future going to need to run more you know from time to time because of including other things the change in renewable uh, generation the whole thing is uh, is moving and, that, and that's partly why we have you know some pretty um, chunky action in way uh, underway in order to make sure that this remains um, okay but um, I hope it doesn't chill renewables um, uh, investment. I mean, the, my argument would be if you can't explain to people that it's going to be okay, then, you know, that is what will undermine. Actually, the action we've taken is more like to say, actually, you know, it's fine to re invest in renewables and it's it makes a lot of sense for Scotland to exploit its renewable um, uh, resources as well as part of the GB mix because you can see here's how the whole thing fits together and uh, you know, if, if 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 Scotland were an island in the middle of, of the Atlantic and we're saying right now we're going to have entirely entirely wind, that would be a different sort of kettle of fish. But it ought to be a um, it ought to be an unlocking thing to say actually security supply is sorted by these mechanisms and actually that's consistent with our low carbon uh, future. And just a final observation: I I haven't seen it impacting on the enthusiasm for development or or the broad support for decarbonising power that I've seen uh, in in the UK. Parliament and when, when the electricity market reform legislation went through, it, it commanded very significant cross-party uh, support and and still does. Um, so, so in a way, I think that's that that's part of the answer probably. Would you mind if I just offer two facts? Because I think it's very easy looking forward to think how impossible the transition looks, but looking backwards, it's quite striking how much we've achieved. So, um, in 2014, I think 19% of uh, power was from renewables. That's quite a big increase over a relatively short period of time and over the three years to this winter uh, I think around 10 gigawatts of coal and oil will have come off the system so it's quite a remarkable transition in a relatively short period of time and we've done that whilst maintaining stable levels of security of supply that meet our reliability standards. So I, realize I, haven't, I haven't talked to your nuclear point, I'm sorry about that um, uh, I mean there are plainly differences around uh, around GB and broader UK about how people feel about different power sources and you need to respect and work with those differences. And I think the same thought um, is probably behind the Conservative Party manifesto on onshore wind planning. Um, you know, that these things uh, you know, only work well when the people who are nearby them are prepared to accept them. Um, uh, we had a quick comment earlier about whether the... Um, uh, you know, whether Hinckley's going to come on or whether that would fill... You know the gap. Well, that that's one thing that that you know maybe and you know nuclear power stations are very large chunks of base load generation. Um, they have some um, they have some risks from a security supply point of view. Um, you know, but since so does every other power source. Um, so uh, you know, uh, the UK government's view is as part of a balanced portfolio, they have their 
part to play, but you completely understand that different parts of the country will regard these in, in different ways. Thank you. Um, John McCullough. Thank you very much, convener. To go straight to your point about about nuclear, um, when I was uh, speaking to uh, um, our witness um, two weeks ago from Ofgem, she was quite clear that the decision to invest in Hinkley Sea was a political decision. Would you agree with that? Well, it's a decision taken by by ministers rather than by Ofgem. Absolutely, just as the um, the decision about how much levy control framework monies be made available um, and the distinction into, as in the last parliament, these different competitive pots. Um, you know, we have a, a process at the moment exploring the potential for um, uh, the lagoon in Swansea, um, uh, you know, to see what the economics of that would look like. Again, the decision to um, enter into that um, is a political decision and the decision ultimately about whether to put the resources into it is also, uh, also political. Um, and... Yes. Obviously, it has a 35-year contract compared to the 15-year contracts that are given to renewables, including pump storage that we talked about earlier. And, and certainly the SSE and Scottish Power were very, very clear that the transmission charging made it um, very difficult for them to go ahead with the pump storage proposals that they had planning permission for. Um, so there is, one would think... A, form of discrimination uh, in favour of nuclear and against pump storage. Certainly they say that they can't go ahead with it um, under the current regime. Uh, so uh, under the coalition government there was a policy of no public subsidy for new nuclear which was set out uh, in Parliament and um, there's certainly been a very careful examination of uh, equal treatment between uh, new nuclear and um, and other technologies. That does not mean it's exactly the same. In many respects, the treatment of new nuclear is um, is more onerous on the new nuclear developers than on uh, than on others. Um, I I suspect, as we talked about earlier, the the pump storage um, uh, question is slightly different because it may be that um, if the if the barrier is the transmission charging, then that may that may change. It may be there's some other barrier that prevents that from uh, coming forward, or it may be that uh, these projects actually don't offer best value. And I'm not I'm not taking a view on that because, sure. I, because I don't how, know. How could it be argued that they don't offer best value than in Hinkley C does? Well, so so the assessment of uh, value for money for uh, Hinkley C was based on a, a range of low carbon uh, alternatives. So they were examining. Um, uh, gas plus carbon price. Um, uh, they're also examining renewable uh, alternatives um, and taken in the round ministers concluded that the CFD uh, on offer offered uh, best value and it was put to the European Commission for approval uh, on that uh, basis. You know, but these debates are are still going on. I don't. I can't say today what. Um, you know what new ministers' uh, views on that because I simply haven't been part yeah, of those as conversations. You say, it's, it's, a, it's a political. It's a, there is it's a, a political for, dimension. It's a decision for ministers. Yeah. Yes, I mean it's, it's not. Yeah. And you know, the European Commission has already said that you know that it will put money onto consumers' bills. So um, any any contract for difference with a strike price that is higher than the um, average price of power in the market will add to consumer bills. Um, uh, and the extent to which you think it will do that depends on your view of the forward power price. Given that we, you know, you have, um, and Ofgem have accepted that we're operating within a, you know, a political framework, um, in terms of these interconnectors that you mentioned earlier, um, I would imagine there's a very large capital cost involved in those interconnectors. Have you any idea what it's going to be, say, you know, even a ballpark figure for Iceland or Norway? Oh, well, they're, they're, they are extremely costly. I'm afraid I haven't got the Iceland numbers or the Norway numbers in my head, but none of that is... Um, that, that is funded on the balance sheets of the companies promoting it, so in effect what they are doing is they are bringing the money forward for that and they're taking a bet they'll be able to make their money back on the price differentials between between the two markets. So, you know, they're operating in a uh, in, in a merchant way from that point of view. It's not a completely 
merchant way because um, they're operating within a regime um, called the cap and floor um, regime, which means that um, you know if they make extremely good returns, uh, then they will share some of that with the energy bill payer. Um, and if for some reason the project, um, you know, despite being operational, makes extremely poor returns, you know, then their debt is is covered. So that, that that's a regime that Ofgem has has developed, but that allows what well, it, it it means that the promoter themselves is taking a significant commercial risk in deciding to bring these projects forward. And that's designed to make sure that they are building the projects which um, they think are going to actually add a significant amount of value. Yeah. If, you, if you design a regime that makes it um, more um, cost efficient to build an interconnector to Iceland or Norway than it does to build pump storage in Scotland, one might suggest that that's a political decision? Well, they're offering slightly different products, I think. So interconnection can... Uh, provide both baseload power and uh, capacity at peak. So in a sense, you're getting two different things of value there. Pump storage is a specialist in, in providing capacity, and these things can compete for the capacity elements of those uh, um, of what they can provide through the capacity market. And there isn't a political dimension within that because the political choice has been to allow them to compete equally as technologies against each other. Whether they can earn revenues in other markets, for example, in the electricity market only, uh, as interconnection can, um, that is, of course, a sort of normal merchant uh, process that they would, would go through. And by and large, that actually allows them to be more competitive and to lower the amount of consumer support that's needed for that technology versus another that might only offer one benefit. Over. But there are transmission charges affecting Scottish um, uh, energy production that don't affect the energy that we're importing from these other countries. Why is that? Sorry, would you mind repeating that question? If, the, if, you, if you import energy through an interconnector from other parts of Europe, those energy providers don't face the transmission charges that an energy provider in this country would. Uh, now, I have to confess, not actually knowing the detail, I can write to you on, on, on this, if you like, uh, of, of the exact charging arrangements that occur when you connect as an interconnector. Um, I, I, I'm pretty certain they do, but I actually don't know the answer to the question, right. so I'll write to you. My understanding is that they don't. If I could... Can, one more question. One more can, yeah. question. Um, this is actually on a, a different topic. It's on um, it's in the upgrade of the uh, transmission system, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is obviously happening everywhere. Um, I represent the south-west of Scotland, um, where the um, transmission uh, line between Stranraer and Carlisle is needing upgraded. Now, when Ofgem were in front of us uh, last week, Kirsty Berg said that they were considering putting a lot of these projects out to tender. Um, now, S Scottish Power and uh, SP Energy Networks are already consulting on that project between Stranraer and Carlisle. Um, if you then, if the government then decided to have a policy change and put it out to tender, the whole thing would be considerably slowed down. Can you give us an indication of whether it's likely to be out to tender? Uh, so I can't give you an indication on that particular uh, yeah. project. Um, uh, in fact, it's Ofgem who are um, suggesting that greater onshore competition uh, would pay dividends for consumers, but I'd say they'd be sensible uh, about it. So if it's already making progress like that, we'd certainly need to look very carefully about you know, whether that was the right one to be starting with. Um, I should say my understanding is not that uh, this is a policy that um, you know would mean all projects would be uh, delayed and you know put out the tender immediately. This is a, a relatively new thing to do uh, for these sorts of assets, uh, and so we would need to be sensible about it. But I can't tell you, unfortunately, the detail of that particular one. Yeah, I think that the thing was that they'd already started a process several years ago, and then suddenly, kind of out of the blue, there's a suggestion that it might be put out to tender, which seems a bit a bit. Um Silly and wasteful, really. So, so this came out of a a, a project that Ofgem itself has been uh, has been running. Um, it's it's certainly an area where ministers are interested because it offers the prospect of um, of greater savings for for the consumer. Um, but I'm sure they'll be sensible about it. Okay, thank you. Okay. thank you. Okay, we've got ten minutes left. I've got three members who want to come back in. So, can I ask them all to be brief? Start with Lewis MacDonald. I think we should touch on carbon capture and storage. There's a, an oil and gas UK conference in Aberdeen today considering the relationship between government and uh, companies in the production of oil and gas. 
My question is around the storage of carbon in depleted reservoirs offshore. Um, what is the position in relation to liability? Uh, in other words, do the private investors who are taking forward schemes for carbon capture and storage, do they expect government to cover the liability in the event of CO2 escaping from those uh, carbon stores? And secondly, uh, connected to that, we had evidence last uh, a couple of weeks ago from Stuart Hazeldean, who uh, works in this area, who was suggesting that the Crown Estate's ownership of the pore space in relation to those reservoirs potentially might be affected by the, the Smith Agreement on the Crown Estate. If that is the case, would that liability therefore be devolved to the Scottish Government? So, uh, this is quite a complicated area. I know a bit about it. Um, uh, the, uh, I know, I, my understanding is that the question of liability is part of the, um, the debate about the terms of any support under a contract that's awarded following the CCS uh, competition, but the best of my knowledge has not yet um, been uh, resolved. Um, you are right that um, CO2 offshore storage is proposed to be transferred under the Scotland Bill currently uh, in the House, and that would mean that the Scottish Government would need to put uh, leasing plans uh, in place. Um, but I suspect the answer to your question about the ultimate liability is it would depend on the nature of the contract, uh, which is negotiated uh, in parallel with the CCS competition. Um, but I don't think that's resolved yet. Uh, that's very helpful. But can, can I understand then if your view is that the, this responsibility is devolved, the contract, when negotiated at the end of this demonstration phase, would be negotiated currently by DEC? Um, would, therefore, the negotiation be uh, uh, changed by devolution? Would Scottish Government have to be at the table, or would Scottish Government take over that negotiation for Scottish uh, reservoirs? Uh, to, to be honest, this is about how, you know, outside my area of expertise, and I, and I wouldn't like to offer you an answer on that, but what I'll do is I'll take that back and, uh, and feed that into colleagues. Thank you very much. OK. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, we've touched upon uh, the subject of strike prices a number of times this morning, but I want to ask you about a specific case. The um, Prime Minister wrote to the convener of Western Isles Council, Angus Campbell, on the 2nd of December, and he made it clear that a strike price for island generation will be forthcoming. Um, and this is Western Isles. So when do you expect the UK government to announce that, the strike, that strike price, and how important is it to ensure we harness the renewable energy generation potential for our islands? Uh, so this is an area where um, I'm going to slightly fall back on what I said at the start about ministers still working through. Secretary of State has had a conversation with um, with Fergus Ewing in which they uh, committed to work together uh, on this issue, so I'm sure that will happen, but I can't give you a timetable, unfortunately, uh, today. But we're in a situation that's six months after that letter came through, and obviously, you know, time... Is, uh, is important that we get this done as quickly as possible because islands have been waiting for a long time for an answer. I mean, is there no indication at all whether it's going to be this year or next year or 10 years' time? Well, uh, clearly it would be very disappointing if it was 10 years' time, mm. um, yeah, but I, I can't offer you any more indication of timing uh, than I've already said, I'm afraid, just because I just don't have it. Okay. Yeah, I think to be fair, we were told in the previous session it would be the autumn of this year. Just look for clarification. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. um, Chick Yes, uh, good morning. Thank you for your explanation about <coughs> the role of National Grid uh, in terms of uh, its transmission operation and system operation. However, it is a monopoly and decisions are taken at the top. Do you think we'd be better off with a publicly owned and managed system operator? Uh, I'd say it's a, it's a live debate uh, at the moment. What is the status of the debate? Uh, the at least it's further up the agenda, apparently. Uh, uh, beg pardon? At least the issue appears to be further up the agenda than it was. In fact, it wasn't even on the agenda. So yes. can you tell us where, it, where the debate is at? Well, so, so the situation is that um, you know, it's formed part of the initial briefing that we shared uh, with our ministers, um, but they have a number of things uh, on their desk, uh, and they'll need to be thinking about that. As I said... Um, uh, earlier, it seems to me that uh, National Grid have a series of, of skills and strengths and the current system works well and they've already made some changes um, you know, in order to make sure that they are uh, fair and seem to be um, fair. Um, uh, but 
you know, it seems to me that uh, Ofgem are thinking about it uh, as well, particularly uh, in the future when you're thinking about whether if you have more storage and more demand side response and so forth, whether that strengthens the case for, for an independent um, system operator. And I'm sure ministers will want to take a, a view on that. It seems to me personally um, a, a fairly finely balanced uh, argument. Okay, and just one other question on me. Um, in an open letter in March 2015 from the Director of Transmission Network at, at National Grid, uh, they said, however, to ensure that we can maintain system stability in even the most extreme circumstances, we are in discussions with thermal generators in Scotland to procure some additional voltage control support from April 2016. A final decision, a final decision outlining our plans will be announced by the end of March 2015. We haven't seen it. Have you seen it? Uh, I have. They announced a voltage control contract with Peterhead. Yeah. Um, we can probably dig out some details or ask National Grid to do so if you'd like to. With the overall plan? Or just, just, it's just been Peter Head that they've talked about, or is there an overall, because it's overall system sustainability? We're talking my understanding about. was that to, um, man, it wasn't about the capacity, it was about managing the, uh, the system quality and security, uh, which uh, required in actually a very remote possibility where uh, a number of thermal plants in Scotland were unavailable. I think it was a one in 600 year possibility that they would not be able to maintain voltage stability without one further capacity unit. Uh, they therefore went out to tender and uh, Peterhead were the successful unit. So they're, they're now comfortable, they have all the tools they need to maintain uh, the system integrity in Scotland. Thank you. Fine. Okay, um, thank you very much. We're at the end of our time. Can I thank the, yeah. The time's offered to supply further information oh. in writing. It'd just be helpful to know if we'd be able to see that before we consider a draft report. Yes, indeed. Well, we're not intending to look at draft report till September, so I'm oh, hoping well, that gives can. Mr. Fine sufficient time to <laughs> respond to our inquiries. Fine, then. Take Unless he's extremely time. busy over the summer. Uh, okay, um, can I thank you both very much for uh, coming along. I appreciate uh, you uh, taking the time to, to come to Edinburgh to speak to the committee. Um, thank you for that, and we'll now have a short suspension to allow a change order.
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, I'd like to welcome our second panel. We're joined by Fergus Ewing, Minister for Business, Energy and Tourism, who's joined today by Dr Graeme Sweeney, co-chair of the Scottish Government's Thermal Generation and CCS Industry Leadership Group, and Dermot Rattigan, who is Head of Energy Markets at Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Um, before we get into questions, Minister, do you want to say something by way of an opening statement? Yes, thank you very much, Convener, and, and uh, good morning to all. Um, I'm pleased to have the chance to address the Committee on the matter of energy security. Uh, as you say, I'm joined by Dr Graeme Sweeney, who is co-chair of the Scottish Government's Thermal Generation and CCS Industry Leadership Group. Graeme is also a member of the Scottish Energy Advisory Board, a, a body co-chaired by the First Minister. Uh, also alongside me is Dermot Rattigan, who is a senior policy advisor in the Scottish Government's Electricity Division, and his work relates to the market for electricity. I uh, welcome this inquiry, convener. The, the timing is apt. Our energy system is in transition as we grapple with key demands around energy security, affordability and reducing carbon emissions. UK government reforms of the electricity market have introduced new support mechanisms for renewables and capacity, and the energy mix is changing as the contribution of renewable energy grows and other forms of generation retire. We have some concerns about the direction of UK policy and regulations, for example, transmission charges, and their implications for our security of supply in Scotland. From a security of supply perspective, we are particularly concerned that UK capacity margins have declined from 15% in 2009 to as low as around 2% in 2016. There is no certainty on UK renewables policy beyond 2020. Recent statements from DEC concerning onshore wind have the potential to damage investor confidence. Electricity is an important part of total energy demand, but other components, principally heat and transport, are even greater in scale, as many of your witnesses, convener, have pointed out, and we need to consider the interactions between each as part of the energy system. Most policy powers over energy matters are reserved to Westminster, and some UK decisions reflect priorities different from those of the Scottish Government. We have sought to work constructively with the UK Government where possible, and will continue to do so. Indeed, I can inform the Committee today that I'm keen to set up a joint intergovernmental group to work with the UK Government on storage solutions. This proposal from the Scottish Government is in part resultant from examination of the extremely useful evidence this Committee has received thus far. Before we take questions, I want to note just a few initial points. First of all, Scotland has huge energy resources. We are the most energy-rich nation in the European Union. And the choices we make on energy have profound impacts for Scotland's social and economic welfare. As evidence to this committee has shown, we need greater clarity around responsibilities for security of supply and the direction of UK policy. We must convene or maintain a balanced mix of energy sources. That has always been our position. Our energy focus goes far beyond electricity. We recognise the importance of a comprehensive and holistic approach to the whole energy system. And in conclusion, I look forward to exploring these and other topics with the committee this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. And you've, you've touched on a whole range of topics that we're keen to cover. We've got about an hour, uh, maybe just a few moments, uh, more than an hour. Um, so I'd ask members if they would keep their questions short and to the point and responses uh, as short and to the point uh, as possible, Minister. And, and just. Uh, you know, feel free to, to bring in your officials as and when as and when you you, you, you wish. Um, can, can I just start off by asking you about the, um, so the on, on the broad policy area? You mentioned the electricity generating policy statement from uh, the Scottish government. We've heard some evidence that that needs to be uh, updated. Um, you'll probably be familiar with um, comments on the record from Professor Paul Younger of Glasgow University talking about government strategy. We heard from. Um, Gina Hanrahan of WWF, who said uh, that uh, WWF believed the EGPS was no longer fit uh, for purpose. And we heard from Professor Stuart Hazeldean, who you'll be familiar with, from Edinburgh, who said in his written evidence, 
uh, the expected closure of Longanet should alert the Scottish Government to its lack of coherent strategy for electricity generation, engine, energy supply and climate ambition delivery in the period post-2020. Why do you lack a coherent strategy? Well, uh, so far as the e – well, I don't, we do not lack a, a, a coherent strategy, I should say, but – uh, uh, That's uh, obviously not Professor Hazeldean's view. Well, I, I work closely with uh, Professor Stuart Hazeldean and uh, uh, also Paul Younger. I've met uh, Paul very recently and uh, work very closely with, with Stuart. I mean, I think it's undoubtedly the case that the EGPS was prepared some time ago, and since then there have been a number of significant developments, uh, developments uh, such as the – threatened closure of uh, Long Island, uh, developments such as the introduction of EMR, and now, post the UK election, considerable uncertainty as to what the UK's policy is going to be for the future of onshore wind. So there have been substantial changes, and uh, therefore I think it will be appropriate in due course to consider the necessity of the updating of the EGPS, uh, uh, and therefore I accept that as all documents which have been prepared uh, in, in the past, they need to be reviewed and reconsidered. I don't actually think that's the key issue facing us today. I think the key issue is what are the right choices that Scotland and the UK should be making. Uh, and uh, I think those have were, so far as I can ascertain from my reading of most of the oral evidence, convener, that you've had over, I think, three weeks, uh, I, I think uh, there's an awful lot of meaty issues that we can come on to discuss this morning in policy terms. But like all documents that are historic, of course it needs to be reviewed and refreshed and updated. I can see that. I don't know if Dermot Rattigan would like to add further to that. Yeah, I mean, we keep, we keep all of these documents under review. I think um, the, the challenge that we have, I suppose, on coherence is the, the challenge that comes from UK policy. And I think you've had... You've had a lot of evidence to the committee uh, about the coherence of UK policy, and as the minister said, uh, things things are changing. We have a new government at Westminster now, so uh, they're starting to take uh, decisions on energy policy, which will affect uh, the way we proceed in Scotland. So there would be an opportunity to review EGPS. I think we wouldn't we wouldn't look at it on its own. We'd look at it alongside other documents that relate to heat and transport. Uh, and we try and all the time to bring those together and make them more co uh, consistent and coherent across the piece. So, as the Minister said, we, we would look to review that. Um, the, the opportunity to do that might be after the next Scottish election. I'm not sure. We haven't taken a decision about that yet. So the defence to incoherence is it's all right for us to be incoherent because Westminster is incoherent too. Okay. Uh, other members want to come in uh, on this issue. I'll start with Dennis Robertson. <laughs> Thanks, good to be here and good morning. Um, Minister, you, you touched in your opening statement uh, about the onshore um, subsidies from uh, UK uh, government and they're proposed, uh, they're sort of proposing that they're going to remove these. Now, given that we've had significant investment already uh, for a lot of these projects, are you concerned that the, a, that, that pro the projects may not continue? And do you think maybe there should be a grace period for those companies to ensure that they perhaps could continue with the appropriate subsidy? Um, well, I have seen the, the press reports, uh, and therefore I am obviously aware of uh, the UK government's apparent intention to, uh, a, to a remove a, or reduce subsidies for onshore wind. We wait to see precisely what decision, if any, will be taken and when. Uh, but just responding generally to the question, convener, you know, I think there's three concerns about any um, move to a, to reduce the level of uh, a renewable obligation contract support uh, for onshore wind and perhaps to do so, as the press have reported a year early, namely in 2016, rather than as planned in 2017. And just to put things in context, I think it was only in 2013 that there was a, a review uh, of the a appropriate level of subsidy for each method of gener generating electricity from renewables. In other words, only two years ago, convener, there was a thoroughgoing official UK government review. That concluded... Uh, uh, amongst other things, in reducing the amount of support for onshore wind from one rock to 0.9 rocks. And we supported that. In other words, there was uh, an agreement 
that that downward reduction was justified, not least because the costs of onshore wind have been coming down. So a lower subsidy a, is appropriate. So we supported that, Convener, but that decision was only made two years ago, and it was made on the basis of the EMR system coming in in 2017. Uh, now, I say that because that's the investment context. Those were the rules. Uh, those were the rules under which uh, investors made decisions to invest huge amounts of money on the basis of the rules as set by the UK government. If it is the case that uh, uh, Amber Rudd uh, makes a decision to bring forward uh, a, the ending of the ROP regime, as has been reported in the press, by a year, then there will be a huge amount of sunk investment uh, that, uh, in projects that will now no longer be able to go ahead, despite the fact that investors acted on the basis of the UK regime as it was and as they promised it would be. Uh, and I think there's, two, a, there's three a, a, a sources of concern. First of all, um, the consumers will face higher costs of electricity. And the reason for that is very simple, that onshore wind is the least expensive large-scale method of generating renewable electricity. That's demonstrated by the recent... Uh, the first round of CFDs, where I think the auction price was around 80 or 82 pounds per megawatt hour for generating electricity from onshore wind. My recollection in relation to offshore wind conveners, the strike prices were around about 114 to 120 pounds. Now that means that if, as I understand it, the UK government will have more offshore wind instead of onshore wind, then it's a simple mathematical equation. Uh, to work out that there will be a huge extra and avoidable cost to the consumer who will have to pay a huge amount more. Now, I haven't done the computation, but Keith Anderson has, and he's on record as saying that the additional cost to the consumer of a decision which is expected by the UK government, we'll have to wait and see what they do, and we have uh, uh, urged them uh, uh, not to pursue such a policy, uh, but uh, the cost as estimated by Keith Anderson, would be between two and three thousand million pounds. Now, I would have thought that the UK government would have wished to avoid exposing the consumer to unnecessary cost, far less unnecessary cost, which a leading industry figure, well respected, uh, the boss of Scottish Power, has estimated at between two and three thousand million pounds, convener. Uh, and that does not seem to me to be a sensible or indeed a rational decision to take. The second group of people who I think will suffer greatly will be, if such a decision were to go ahead, will be communities. Because if, uh, if there is a, 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 a Damoclean sword that is going to be swiped on projects, community projects that cannot get grid connections, because they have difficulty, we believe, in getting grid connections on the distribution network, uh, may well be left stranded and may well be the first to say, the games of bogey, we can't go ahead with these projects. So it's not all about big companies, convener. It's not all about uh, big companies who, you know, who are able to look after themselves, you might say. It's about community projects as well. And lastly, of course, the sunk investment in, in the schemes that may not go ahead uh, will cost a number of jobs, a significant amount of investment. And lastly, my understanding uh, from the industry is that 75% of the projects that are at risk are in Scotland. And therefore, the, the brunt of any decision along the lines that has been predicted will fall on this country. Oh, okay, Minister, can I just say, if we have slightly shorter answers yeah. to questions, that would be quite helpful. Thank you. Uh, Dennis uh, thank you. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, Minister, so fr from, from your statement there, uh, your answer to the question, you would... Um, support then a grace period for those companies that have already made an investment um, to ensure that they can go ahead with their projects? Uh, we do not believe that uh, uh, an early closure of rocks is a sensible decision. And I have already conveyed our concerns in a letter to Amber Rudd. And in particular, we think that to make such a decision uh, would expose the UK government and therefore the taxpayer and the consumer to the risk, a serious risk of judicial review, the outcome of which may be uncertain. Uh, if, however, to answer Mr Roberts's question, convener, uh, briefly, there is to be such a decision, then it must be ameliorated by grace periods. 
and those grace periods should be widely drawn to cover projects and planning. Minister, um, do you welcome the uh, Scottish Conservative support from Jamie McGregor that onshore wind is, is something that uh, certainly he said that if this, this is Conservative uh, policy to support onshore wind? Well, I very much welcome that, and I look, I look forward to an endorsement convener from your good self as to the clear statement from your colleague, Jamie <laughs> McGregor, that, uh, and I, I don't have the document in front of me, but I think I can remember it because it was somehow brought to my attention. He said that uh, the, Scottish gov the, the Scottish Conservatives support onshore wind appropriately cited, and I, I hope that that's something that not only Mr McGregor uh, a, a support, and I know that you don't have to, like some of your colleagues, disclose a financial interest in this regard. Uh, well, uh, Minister, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that you probably will have to determine this particular appeal, so it may be uh, might better not to go too far down this route. But just for the things you mentioned me, it's probably fair to say I've always agreed that uh, my party policy position has always been that Onger Wind has a part to play as part of the energy mix. I should say, for the, well, I very much appreciate that. I, I think the, the project concerned is not one which would come before me, but I, do, no, right. I don't make a comment on any particular no, project, right. so it's a perfectly okay. fair comment. Right. Could be Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I think Lewis MacDonald wants to come in on this as well. Yes, thanks very much. I mean, the electricity generation policy statement, Minister, that you mentioned, uh, you yeah. talked about the issue of coherence, but this, this policy statement is less than two years old. Surely the issue here is not so much about coherence, but it's about its impact. So the Scottish Government says it wants 2.5 uh, gigawatts of uh, new um, thermal power in Scotland, but nobody's listening. The, 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 the Scottish Government can say what, anything it wants. It doesn't have the clout to actually influence the big privatised companies which control this market. Well, I think that's a very good argument for independence, if I may say so, because plainly uh, we sought to have the power precisely to to have his say over these matters. Uh, but I do agree to, to one extent that, um, a, that uh, our EGPS, which incidentally, convenient, just for the record and from memory, uh, a Lang Bank is on record as quoting, this is of WWF, you quoted them earlier. Lang Bank said that our EGPS was perfectly feasible and the achievement of the 220 target was uh, technically possible. Uh, and they, and uh, I think Gina Hanrahan, who gave evidence to this committee, also said that they welcomed our decarbonisation target of 230. Uh, but uh, regarding thermal generation, yes, we, we think that there needs to be a balance, and uh, we said that we needed 2.5 uh, gigawatts of thermal generation, progressively fitted with carbon capture and storage within a time scale. Uh, uh, that, uh, that is part of our EGPS, which contains a commitment to generate 100% of the electricity that we consume from renewable sources by 2020. But uh, just the, the last point I make in response to, to um, Mr. Mr. McDonald's question, Convener, is this, that um, as Scottish Power have indicated, um, the reason, the, the causa causans, the, the main reason why they are minded to close Langanet is because they face higher transmission charges than if they were uh, generating electricity and, for example, Surrey. And as matters stand at the moment, whether it's Longana or Peterhead, who are operating at much reduced capacity because of the economics, as was stated in evidence to a previous committee uh, hearing of this committee, uh, the fact is that as long as these transmission charges are of the order of 30 million per station more than they would be if they were generating in Surrey, then surely it's not... Uh, uh, no one could expect that any company are going to make an investment decision, Mr MacDonald, in new thermal plant. But the serious question I asked the Minister was not about a constitutional question. It was about how the public sector, government at whatever level, deals with corporations of the scale of Scottish Power. And simply quoting Scottish Power with approval uh, doesn't exactly demonstrate a willingness or a capacity to take on those players and to try and influence the market. What does the Scottish Government, given its powers that it does have, how does it intend to influence the decisions that are made by these companies? Well, um, we have uh, worked very closely with Scottish Power, with SSE and with a huge number of companies. Uh, and I would submit, Convener, that particularly in the renewables field, we have done so to great success. Uh, what influence do we have? Well, I, I can tell you, Mr MacDonald, go and speak to companies and see what they think about the Scottish Government and our reputation about renewables. What they think and what they have told me over the past four years increasingly is they welcome the policy certainty in Scotland and what they're concerned about 
is the policy confusion and uncertainty that has existed down south, where at the one point they go ahead with a review of ROCs 0.9 for onshore wind, uh, and then in a manifesto they say they're going to scrap new subsidies, new subsidies, mark my words, and then they apparently are minded to scrap existing subsidies or reduce them, not new subsidies, but existing ones. So no wonder the companies that I have spoken to, convener, over several years now uh, are happy with the a approach that the Scottish government say of trying to decarbonise energy over a realistic time frame and clearly encouraging renewable energy. And perhaps, convener, that's why we have had so many companies seeking to, uh, to perform their developments in, in Scotland. Minister, that when asked about how government can develop policy independently of corporations, you simply quote your good relations with those corporations. I think the problem is that, that, that you are, you're, you're not addressing the question of leverage. But can I move on to a slightly different question, because you said a lot already about o onshore wind. Uh, what, what's the Scottish Government doing to uh, examine other possible areas of renewable uh, technology, for, uh, you, and you, you, you were critical there of, of the UK government. DEC has um, certainly been very positive about solar photovoltaic energy, and we heard that quoted this morning by the witnesses we had in front of us from, from DEC. What is the Scottish Government doing to replicate that commitment to developing solar voltaic in Scotland, uh, and, and, and how much do you, does the Minister, uh, being aware, I'm sure, of, of, of the balance of the evidence given by DEC this morning, how much does the Minister believe that uh, other renewable technologies can contribute to the targets in the 2020s? Um, well, I, first of all, could I just say that it wasn't industry that uh, set our target at 100% renewables, it was the Scottish Government. So if there's some sort of new suggestion that companies are driving our policy, well that plainly, I, I would suspect, doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. To answer the question, of course we... Uh, of course, we believe that there should be a mix of renewables, and our policy has clearly supported that. Uh, we have uh, been very supportive of solar, uh, and we have also been supportive of hydro, of tidal and marine, of biomass, of anaerobic digestion. And this morning earlier, convener, I remarked on the need to look at storage solutions, including pump storage, which perhaps we may come on to, uh, but also looking at the matters which were raised in evidence by witness about Tesla batteries, about liquid air, about hydro, about hydrogen. And I read the evidence of a numerous, numerous witnesses who made a number of telling points, as well as energy efficiency measures, which should never be neglected or forgotten about. So uh, we have, I don't think anyone, a convener, has ever criticised the Scottish Government before about not supporting renewables. I'm not sure if Mr Macdonald is now doing so, but if so, I would say good luck. Well, I'm asking you a very specific question, Minister. The, the, the Department of Energy and Climate Change of the UK has given a commitment uh, to a very significant deployment uh, of solar PV on government buildings, uh, a gigawatt to be in, uh, installed in the government estate. Is that something the Scottish Government would, would look to replicate? In well, Scotland? I can see the Scottish Government and myself playing a part are already looking at that. We have been looking at that for some considerable time. And I know that that is something that the Scottish Government, uh, within, its, uh, within the uh, various portfolios, uh, because I'm not in the lead of uh, government buildings energy solutions, but I do know that they are looking at uh, uh, how our energy is used more effectively, uh, energy efficiency measures, and solar could well play a part in that. So I can, I can and it's a serious point Mr McDowell makes, I can provide him with a total assurance that that is something that is a uh, work in progress at the current time, and, and extremely important. Thank you very much. Um, Richard Lowe. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, can I? I'll, t I'll take my questions in reverse since uh, uh, Lewis Macdonald raised the, the one of the points I was going to put up. During the election, and if you go round uh, most schools now, you see a lot of solar panels on the roofs. Um, would it be the intention uh, in your discussion with, and I know it, it doesn't come under you, but um, in your in your discussions with the, the Housing Minister to look at uh, encouraging? New, when new houses are being built, both private um, um, uh, housing association or uh, council, that we look at installing that condition that solar panel, uh, solar panels are on the roofs. Um, most people uh, are looking at that nowadays. Would you encourage that? Um, well, I, I, I think it, it certainly is uh, sensible to look at using the public estate. Uh, and the roofs of public estate for solar panels. And I think there's an element of that in Scotland. I think there's, there's a room for a lot more of that. 
uh, I uh, don't have responsibility for what happens in schools or indeed convener on top of schools. Uh, but I'm sure that that, that that is a suggestion that uh, should be considered fully and uh, I, 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 perhaps if uh, Mr Lyle would like to write to the Education Secretary then I would be entirely supportive of that being properly explored. And I would, I would also write to the Housing Minister in, in regards to encouraging solar panels on uh, new build, uh, both private uh, housing associations. Anyway, um, for a number of years we were always, always told that Scottish Power or Scotland was exporting well over 20% or had the extra capacity and power within Scotland. Given the mismanagement of Westminster energy policies, and that's resulted in a capacity margin, which you already said is as low as 2% by some estimates. Can Scotland rely on generation from the south of border, or does it, make, does it not make sense to ensure that we have sufficient generation here in Scotland? Well, there's a number of questions in there. I mean, firstly, so far as the, uh, the margin, the security margin is concerned, I mentioned in my opening remarks that... Uh, this has dwindled to a level which many commentators may feel is parlously low. Um, I'm looking for a quotation that I can't find, but I can kind of remember it anyway. Uh, and that is that various academic experts, of, uh, including Sir John Armit, I think used to advise the Labour Party, have uh, opined that a better margin would be in the region of 10 to 20 per cent. Professor Helm. Who is Professor Helm? Um, well, I'll bring in Graeme Sweeney, if I may, in a minute, and he can, he, he's, uh, he, he has Dieter Helm, the Professor of Energy Policy at University of Oxford, north of 10, but probably less than 10%. And I think anyone can see that a, a margin of 2% two, or two thereabouts is, is parlously low. And, of course, there are other problems that occur when you get as low as that, because that means that uh, when supply and demand are equally balanced, then the, the suppliers can push up the prices, Okay. Uh, if there's oversupply, prices come down. So it's not actually good for the consumer. Um, the other factor that occurs to me is that uh, you know, we have had extensive discussions with National Grid about this, convener, and we take a different view. And I'll, I'll bring in Graeme Sweeney to talk about some of our concerns about security of supply, including black start and voltage stability, uh, some of which uh, uh, has been considered by your witnesses. But uh, you know, one of the suggestions that we understand was considered by National Grid uh, over the past year or so uh, in relation to what happens where Longanet to cease operation is that they would introduce power barges. Now, this was something that uh, we eventually discovered from National Grid they were considering. They didn't raise it with us when they initiated the consideration of using power barges in Scotland. And we were extremely concerned about that because, plainly, a, such a, a method of meeting supply is normally associated with meeting supply in developing countries where there is no major electricity supply, uh, not in a country like Scotland. And the implications for security, for uh, maintenance of security services uh, of other issues were not uh, matters that we had the opportunity to consider because the National Grid did not consult us about it. And that is why I welcome the assurances that National Grid uh, uh, have now made to have a more transparent relationship with this Parliament, uh, brought about, I think, in part by the work of uh, members of this committee. Uh, so we are concerned about the security of supply. We think there's considerable problems with it. There's a number of aspects to it, not all of which I've touched upon uh, convener, but whether from Scotland or GB basis, a, a margin of 2 to 5 per cent is not sensible. It's bad news and it's something that must now be addressed. Maybe, Minister, I could just uh, again exhort you to maybe slightly shorter answers. Well, they are complicated questions. I, think, quite, I don't think I actually even answered all the questions there because there was about three and I only answered one of them. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Sweeney. Th thank you, uh, convener. Uh, you, you rightly ask. So what are we doing? And as always, I like to act within the space that we have to create new options for the future. So what are we doing? We took the matter of security of supply appropriately seriously. We commissioned a review led by Alistair Buchanan, which confirmed our suspicions. The Commission on Energy Market Regulation added their view that this was likely to be a serious issue. And we commenced an interaction with National Grid 
particularly around this winter which has just passed. As it turned out, it was a relatively mild winter. That wasn't the point. In that process, we have understood a great deal more about the way natural, national grid undertake the task, but not sufficient to be able to understand exactly what might happen in the future. The key issue that has arisen out of this, and the clarity over this, I think, has come out of this process, is the matter of Black Start. We should be absolutely clear that post the closure of Long Annet, our Black Start performance will deteriorate substantially. It was around 12 hours beforehand. It may go out to as much as 30 hours afterwards. This leads to these matters going on the risk registers of companies, which are least likely to invest in the future. And electricity is not just, as is often characterised, about keeping the lights on. It's about keeping the water pumping and the telecoms working. So these are real matters of concern. The energisation of that system would require almost all of the pumped hydro to be available prior to the re-energisation after the black start. All of this is a clear set of concerns. It's also clear to us as a result of this process that we don't understand how they do quality trade-offs. How did they even think that the power barges should be part of the solution set? We will know more. They have committed to us that they will bring to this parliament an annual Scottish capacity assessment for open and transparent review. And this is a huge progress over where we were before. But it's also clear, because you have heard evidence that, and whether it's south of the Wash or south of the Watford Gap depends on how you want to view it, it is very clear that the only place that any thermal capacity is going to be built is as close to London as you can get a capacity licence. This is in part because the grid prefer wires to generation capacity, and therefore they want to connect everything. But from our point of view, the case for a regional factor to determine there should be continuing activity is part of our overall economic growth. So we need to formulate a policy platform through whatever our interactions are that gets us to a change in the terms and conditions of this. Otherwise, we will indeed see substantial erosions of our capacity to perform. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Can I ask you, and I can't remember who the witness was, but we had a witness who came in front of us who said, don't need to worry, they could all close down, all we need to do is turn the voltage down. What would you, what would you say to that? So I understand. Um, of course, you could indeed undertake general synthetic methods. You can change the voltage by the way we do that now. And you can also operate at a different cycle or phase. We do all of that now. And on the days when we have been close to the margin, we have done all of that already. I would not recommend that you rely on that as a forward solution. It's part of the toolkit, but it won't solve the problem. Okay. So on this point, can I just go back to the point about the capacity margin? It's quite important because we did take a lot of evidence on this. I'm just looking at the official report for the 20th of May when we had with us a whole host of, of experts, Professor Ian Arbin from the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, Professor Keith Bell, Strathclyde, Brian Galloway from Scottish Power, Professor Gareth Harrison from Edinburgh, Professor Colin McInnes from Glasgow, Dr Edward Owens from Heriot Watt, we had Michael Riley from Scottish Renewables, Lawrence Slade from Energy UK and Dr Alan Walker from the Royal Academy of Engineering. Now, in, in that evidence session, Professor Keith Bell was very clear that he did not believe that the capacity margin set by National Grid was too low. And I asked... And I asked the rest of the panel if anyone disagreed with them, and nobody did. So we've got this whole array of people who have spoken to the committee who disagree with the evidence you've just told us. So I understand the, uh, the point. So I think a little bit of this depends on how you ask the question. And by the way, you did have evidence from Professor Helm which said that whilst the historical capacity margins were too high, and I agree with that. The issue was whether or not very low capacity margins were sustainable going forward. And the critical question here is, on what are you going to rely? So we would argue that very low capacity margins are unlikely to help us with our net black start conditions, 
and are unlikely to promote economic growth for us. So there is an overall case for optimising the way in which you drive welfare here, as opposed to an entirely mechanical view of what may be the minimum margin you can live with. Because it's clear on occasions with these capacity margins that we have now, we have managed to survive when there has been very, very low contributions from the renewable system. And that's been, I think, testament to the way in which that operates. So we would argue it needs to be higher. And we would argue that the case for regionally based criteria for investment is clear and should be made with a loud voice. And, and would you also accept, Dr Sweeney, that additional capacity needs to be paid for and that will impact on consumers' bills? So I understand that capacity needs to be paid for. The, 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 the more telling point is that in the absence of capacity and outages, the costs need to be paid for too. So we need a resilient system and we need to have an economically optimised outcome. You don't want to build too much capacity, but you don't want too little capacity because the economic activities that are reduced as a result of that are substantial. Lewis McDonald, briefly. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Mr. Rattigan, want to come in. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of points to what uh, Graham was saying there. I mean, you you start to you start to meet consequences of a lower capacity margin even before the lights go off, and I think that's the point the minister's highlighting from Dieter Helm. Dieter Helm said. You know, as, as the capacity margin falls, inevitably uh, prices go up. Now, that that isn't a factor that National Grid have to work into their um, assessments. It's not something they have to give account on. But that that seems logical as demand, demand and supply narrow. The gap between demand and supply narrows, the prices go up. So there's a consequence there. And I think also Scottish Water's evidence, uh, the gentleman who spoke, I think it's Chris Toop, he said they are taking action now to reduce their reliance on the grid. Now, they're doing that because they've identified this as an issue. So, again, there's another cost there. The other, the other thing that I picked up from Scottish Power Energy uh, Electricity Network's written evidence was that uh, there's three issues you need to think about. Capacity, you need to think about the overall level of power on the system. But they said, importantly, the, the issue that's local is flexibility. And there may not be a GB issue, but there has been an issue in Scotland. Now, we know that because National Grid have had to procure additional voltage control services before the Western uh, HVDC cable links up. So they're, they're already taking action there. And again, there's a cost to that. And then lastly, the point that Keith Bell made in his evidence, which I think he did, he did say that he didn't think there was a capacity issue as such, but one thing that he said, which I think was interesting, was that National Grid don't have to make a calculation between whether you have more generation in an area like Scotland or whether you have uh, more grid. Uh, and that trade-off isn't always made. Now, it could be that the cheaper solution for Scotland is to have more generation here. And that, I think that's the point that Graham's making too. So those... Those were, I think those give a more rounded picture of why narrowing capacity margins are a problem even before the lights start to go out. Okay, I've got some members who want to come in on this briefly. Liz yeah, briefly. I mean, given, given what has been said here, and Dr Sweeney did not dispute the Keith Bell's analysis that there was no capacity reason for additional capacity, but, that, but uh, uh, so it seemed to me. But, but, but I'm very interested to know what the vision is. So if there is a, a revised electricity generating policy statement coming forward, would the government still anticipate new thermal plant? And would that still be the case even if the ca carbon capture and storage demonstration projects fail to demonstrate commercial viability at scale? Good question. So, yeah, thank you. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a matter of some curiosity, mm -hmm. isn't it, that those thermal power plants which are most likely to progress in Scotland are intimately linked with the CCS story. Although you could also argue, from the point of view of meeting overall energy and climate change targets, that's a good thing. But if those did progress, we'd have about half of what was in the EGPS. And that's already a substantial uh, step forward. I, I think that the key point here is that the resilience of the system is the key. And we need a proper, I would say, plan 
as opposed to a set of independent marketplace interventions that adds up to that resilient system we want to have. We want high penetration of renewables. It's clear. We all want that. And the issue is that to complement that, so this is not a one thing or another, you have to do them all, there is a very clear economic case for including thermal power with CCS in the long run. At the European level, by the way, it will cost €4 trillion Euros more to decarbonise without CCS. And let me make one other point about all of this, because these are linked issues which the case we need to make is that many industrial activities have carbon process emissions, and those need to be dealt with too. That makes the CCS story also particularly important. We can either offshore the CO2 or we can offshore the jobs, and we ought to be clear about that with 1.3 million jobs at stake. So regional factors play here as well, and one of the key things that would change all of these outcomes was if we had clarity over the use of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in the North Sea. And I'll recommend to you that you have a look at the Scottish Karma Capture and Storage report on that that was released yesterday. So these things all come together as part of how that story should build up. High renewables, absolutely, sure. but you need this. If you don't have it, you end up with the power stations in the south, you can't evacuate the CO2, we missed the climate targets, and we have no regional stability in the way in which we previously described. But just let me be clear about what's not in, in the answer you just gave. If carbon capture and storage does not prove effective and successful at commercial scale, there is no government plan B. No, well, I think you know, I'll answer that on behalf of the government. That, I mean, first of all, you heard an evidence that, uh, from Stuart Hazeldean, I think, that it is expected that the Peterhead project, which he said is simpler than the project, uh, White Rose project, is expected to go on stream before the end of this decade. So I think to postulate failure when, you, when the expert witness on this topic, uh, Stuart Hazeldean, has already said that it's likely to succeed in, in convener. I had the opportunity to visit Peter Head and see the presentation, and it's expected that this project will go ahead. Shell and SSE are wholly committed to it. Uh, what we would like to see in Scotland is more CCS going ahead, and I think uh, Professor Hazeldean also pointed out that uh, there is a, another interesting project of Summit Power which would allow a CCS project using coal and decarbonising the use of coal as a method of provision of electricity would go ahead. So I don't think we should postulate failure when we're getting, happily for the first time ever, quite close to limited success. We, we shouldn't postulate failure, Minister. But, well, that's, but, that's but, what you were doing. No, not at all. I, I hope the project proves to be very successful. However, it is a demonstration project, and my question is simply, if it doesn't prove to be successful, what is Plan B? Well, again, you see, it, my understanding, convener, is that the... The, the UK government, and the, uh, this may be an imperfect, uh, imperfect understanding, but the UK government are supportive of CCS. Yeah, so I look absolutely. forward to having a constructive relationship uh, with, with Amber Rudd and uh, that we will work together uh, in relation to delivery of more CCS projects. Indeed, uh, we think that there's, there is a, a... I don't know if this is a matter for jocularity, convener, but... Uh, well, but, no, but, no, but I haven't answered the question Mr McDonald's asked three times, but... Uh, well, I am answering the question that uh, he said you need a plan B. Well, we, I don't, why should we have a plan B when we're going ahead with the CCS project? There's another one in the wings, and there's a willing partner in the UK to have more CCS projects. So the question doesn't really arise. But it's a demonstration project. All right. Dr. Sweeney wanted to come in, then we need to move on. Right. I, just, I, just, I just wanted to say that um, I had said earlier that we should seek to ensure that the capacity mechanism, when it comes into play, has a regional correction factor in it for a range of reasons, and that would provide a route to uh, thermal power. But it's clear that for everybody, those policy changes need to be in place. Let me just say one other thing, because we often talk about this stuff as if it was extraordinarily high risk and entirely unknown. I just think it's useful to understand where we sit competitively. We characterise ourselves as the people who care most about the matter of getting energy and climate policy to converge so that we can meet both of these targets. We often characterise the North Americans as not caring about this stuff at all. And yet the Americans are putting 60 million tonnes of CO2 underground every year and learning how to do all this at scale. The Canadians are doing it, the Australians are doing it, and the Chinese are doing it. So the task for us is we should get out there and do it. And if you want a very, very specific view of it, we should go to Canada and Saskatchewan 
Saskatchewan has a relationship with Canada, perhaps quite like the relationship of Scotland with the United Kingdom. And there, they have brought online already this project. So it's not beyond us to do this, and all of the portents to do this are good. Right, I need to move on. Check with you. Yes, good afternoon. Um, Camille, you said, this, as rightly, that we've had a whole array of different positions, re capacity margins, in, and there was some uh, reference to uh, Professor Bell. Uh, he didn't say everything was all right because on page 19 of the official report of 20th of May, he said it's right that some national grid scenarios suggest that the margin will get small in the next couple of years. So while we don't want to talk about the constitutional problem, let's talk about the competency problem. There are two elephants in the room, a bull elephant and a somewhat baby elephant, the bull elephant being the national grid and the baby elephant being off gem. Um, do we actually believe that the national grid is the right body a very large, monopolistic, uh, 3.8 billion profitability, uh, uh, as it had uh, two years ago. Is that the right body to act and depend upon as a systems operator? Yes. Well, I don't think uh, the technical expertise is in doubt of national grid, and I think uh, there were various uh, witnesses who who supported that that view. I think the question more is. Uh, who ultimately is responsible for security of supply in the UK? Now, I would argue that it's the UK Energy Minister and ultimately the UK Cabinet. That should be the answer to that. But when, as earlier this year, the First Minister and myself raised this issue with the UK Government, it's plain that the UK Government immediately uh, uh, take the position that National Grid is essentially the arbiter of these matters. And I think that that is inherently an unsatisfactory position. Uh, and, and, you know, whilst I have no complaint particularly about the fact that National Grid is a private company, nonetheless one can't exclude consideration of the fact that they do have a commercial interest in maximising the profits for their shareholders. So I think uh, a bit more clarity in ultimate responsibility for UK energy policy would be desirable. In theory it's the Cabinet, but in practice it's, it's the National Grid. And I'm not sure that that's... I'm not making any aspersions about anybody here. I'm just saying that's not really a perfect uh, recipe for success. Graham, do you want to? I, mean, I, 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 I would say that um, it isn't National Grid's remit to keep the lights on, as we tend to describe it. And anyway, operationally, they separate generation from transmission, and it's hard for me to see how you could be accountable for that outcome okay. if you do that. And... We've made the points about um, the, the, the way in which they operate. If you looked back to the Commission on Energy Market Regulation that published last year, you'd have seen that the proposal for any putative independent regulator in Scotland was proposed to be different from that structure and to have clear accountability for the delivery of the keeping the lights on strategy. It is very difficult, so difficult, I'll say there is no one to actually go and talk to about that so that you can get a coherent answer to the problem. So change is required because the changes we are going through are not marginal changes to what we had. We had a huge and super legacy and we benefited from that over a long period of time. The forward changes are substantial, particularly on the demand side we're going to move to a completely different world. We need somebody to plan to be resilient in that world, and we need to know who that is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, John McCall. Yes, thank you very much, convener. Yes, can I say that I welcome uh, the minister's announcement this morning that uh, you're going to approach the UK government about a, a joint working body on storage solutions. Can Can you tell us what the Scottish government's priority? is with regard to storage solutions? Um, well, thank you. Well, well, we believe that storage solutions uh, should play a greater part in the overall mix. And, and I should say that I had suggested, convener, I think last year, last November, to the UK government in a letter that there should be a group set up to consider pump storage solutions, and that was rejected in January this year by a, the then UK Energy Minister. However, uh, my proposal this morning is that we should widen out from pump storage to considering storage solutions as a whole, uh, because since last year uh, we're aware of the 
considerable debate about the wider range of story solutions that exist in the world. In fact, one of your witnesses put it well, there should be story solutions at transmission, distribution and at household level, not just one. But I think on a, on a macro level, the real opportunities are in pump storage. And we have in Kruachan and Corrie Glass, uh, at Kruachan and Foyers, two existing stations, but we also have, as I think Mr Brodie pointed out, or Mr MacDonald in, in questions before, two consented schemes around the Great Glen, which really could provide an excellent uh, purpose. I think uh, Mr Rattigan has got quite a, some useful technical information that perhaps would be helpful for um, a Joe McAlpine. We've been we, we speak regularly to the you know to all the companies in Scotland, so I'll particularly focus on the, the large scale point about uh, pump storage. But as Mr. Ewing said, we want storage at all uh, levels, you know, from the, the top, the, the system level, at the local level, and you know within houses and businesses. All of, and I think there was an awful lot of been a lot of evidence to your committee that suggests the value of storage, but it's it doesn't seem to be coming forward in the way that. Uh, people would hope that it would, and in many cases it doesn't yet seem to uh, stack up economically. Now, at the large scale level for pump storage, no one, the companies that have uh, schemes that are on the drawing board, they can't take them forward at the moment because they're very capital intensive, they're projects that need to work over very long periods of time, decades to pay back. Uh, under the capacity market as it's being designed at the moment, it doesn't support that kind of new investment in large scale storage. So one of the solutions that might come forward, which would be similar to the deal that exists for interconnectors, is maybe that uh, there would be a cap and floor type mechanism where uh, revenues below a certain point, um, that, you know, if, if, this, if the storage that came forward wasn't um, making a, a minimum amount that would be made up, but also if the storage proved to be more uh, economically successful than had been thought at the beginning, those revenues would be paid back to the taxpayer. So we're in the process of thinking about those, how the policy could be designed, and that's exactly why we want the kind of group that uh, the Minister has just pointed out. Uh, we would want to develop that with industry and with the UK government. Thank you very much. When I spoke to um, two weeks ago, when Ofgem was giving evidence, um, the Ofgem representative admitted that the reason why um, uh, Hinkley C was getting uh, more public subsidy than pump storage, a 35-year contract compared to 15 years, was a political decision, and that the Ofgem were working within that political framework. Um, is that something that, uh, how does one overcome that obstacle, given that, you know, like, um, it's not actually based on what's most economical, but there's a ideological uh, decision driving it? Well, I think there's, there's, certainly, uh, there's certainly the option is there to the UK government to, to agree bilateral contracts that would underpin the building of new pump storage. Uh, and as I've said, there's been... Uh, arrangements are now being made to support the development of new interconnectors and they are, they're having to reach a regulatory settlement that, that sets these caps and floors that allows them to be built. So something like that would be, the, would be probably the kind of mechanism that would unlock new pump storage, uh, but also that the capacity market needs to change so longer term contracts could be given uh, to underpin the building of these kind of assets. Um, we, I mean, we think pump storage is uniquely uh, beneficial because there's so so many benefits at the system level it's very it's very fast you know it comes on very quickly in a matter of seconds from spinning reserve it's incredibly reliable it's probably the most reliable type of generation that exists so its availability at times of peak is near to 100% um, and it helps reduce costs on other parts of the system so where there's constraints elsewhere uh, renewable energy having to be constrained off or the need for more transmission upgrades to be built it offsets some of those costs so um, despite all of those benefits there isn't yet a policy mechanism which allows the, the the companies that have schemes on the drawing board to progress them to take a financial decision 
Can I ask Dr Sweeney, um, you, you mentioned earlier Black Start and you talked about hydro pump storage and do you see uh, an, an expansion of hydro pump storage as important to, to dealing with Black Start in future? Yes, we do. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it, it, it's a critical part of the mix. Right. And when you were talking about the need for a regionally based criteria for investment, is that what you, were you thinking along those lines, that we should have more regionally based criteria for investment in pump storage? Indeed. It's not to be limited to any particular part of the solution. Indeed, you need regional criteria across the piece to be part of the way in which we undertake this, this task. Agreed. Thank you very much. Convener, if you bear with me, I just want to ask the Minister this particular constituency question that I asked Dick this morning. Um, the Minister is aware that SP Energy Networks have been investing, uh, or have been looking at some time, of upgrading the transmission line between Stranraer and Carlisle. Two weeks ago, when Ofgem gave evidence to this committee, they said that they were looking at pu putting such schemes out to tender. I spoke to SP Energy Networks in Glasgow on Monday, and they were unsure as to what this meant for their plans to upgrade the line between Stranraer and Carlisle, which obviously has very serious implications for businesses in uh, my area, because obviously parts of the line date back to the 1930s. Um, couldn't get a, an answer this morning from DEC on that. Would that concern you? Because obviously um, the whole thing would be um, slowed down considerably. It's already out to consultation. If it was put out to tender, it would be slowed down for a number of years. Well, well I'm not aware of all the details, so I think perhaps the best thing I can do, Convener, rather than make any comment with, about ma matters and facts that I, uh, are, I'm, on which I'm unsighted, I will look into the matter and write to you, Convener, to clarify matters. Thanks very much. Thank you. OK. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, some of the ev evidence we've heard over the last few weeks has suggested that when Long Gannett closes and putting to one side the Black Start issues, there could be times when we have to uh, import electricity from the rest of the UK, especially when the wind isn't blowing. So, uh, although overall we will still remain a net exporter of electricity. Has any work been done to calculate how often this potential need to import electricity is likely to happen? Um, well, at, at the moment, um, of course, we're part of the GB energy system and we support the integrated uh, electricity system, uh, but we still export the vast majority of the time, around 98%, I believe, of the time Scotland is uh, exporting. Um, uh, and therefore, that is matters as they stand at the moment. Plainly, uh, a, the loss of Longanet will s significantly alter mm alter that balance, and that is a matter of concern, especially uh, when I think it is uh, just self-evidently the case that, that uh, although there is scope for new uh, thermal generation, for example in Kikensee, where I granted consent for a new gas power station, uh, or in Peterhead, where they have uh, mothballed uh, most of their capacity, uh, could be uh, reused that that's not going to happen because of the transmission charges. So I, I think uh, Mr McDonald is, is right to say that uh, as well as the economic consequences of the loss of Long Garrett, which will be of serious concern in uh, around uh, the area and in Fife, as we are considering with the Fife Council, uh, uh, and social concern too, uh, as well as to Hunterston and the railways and many contractors, it will also have... Uh, an adverse effect on our, our exporting electricity down south. I don't know if Mr Rattigan wants to add to any of the, the, the various technical aspects of this uh, convener. Yeah, I think the pattern of, of exports and imports will change. Uh, there's an awful lot of um, further um, renewables capacity in the planning system in Scotland. And if, if that was to come through, and that, that is dependent, as the Minister said earlier on, on the continuation of support uh, systems that are in place at the moment. Uh, so the pattern of exports and imports between Scotland and England will change. Uh, and on days when there's when it's very windy, we will be exporting uh, mm -hmm. very heavily. And other days we'll be importing. But Mike Calview, I think when he was at the committee in March, he said most of the time, even without Long Annette, Scotland will still be exporting power. And the design of the grid, the national uh, grid and the Scottish transmission companies are taking forward, enables that. Uh, the, 
the ability to import and export is rising quite significantly, particularly after the West Coast HVDC link is uh, connected. I, I just want to ask, um, we're in a situation where you've just identified that most of the time that we'll, we will be exporting, but there is a need for this base load capacity in Scotland. Um, a lot of the evidence has suggested that, you know, that we can depend on the rest of the, the UK. But having said that, we, we're aware that up to a quarter of the UK's generating capacity is due to close. And we're also aware that um, they are becoming more and more dependent on interconnectors with when the Belgium interconnector comes on and the one from Norway comes on, then the inter interconnection power uh, will virtually double. Is it sensible uh, for us to have to depend on the rest of the UK for uh, electricity or does it make more sense to ensure we have sufficient base load here to, make our own, to meet our own requirements? The, the outcome is essentially um, driven by the market signals. So mm. um, we, as Mr Ewing has said, there's, there, is, there is scope to increase our output in Scotland mm. from Peterhead. Uh, but at the moment, the way gas prices are and the way the transmission charging system works, uh, that capacity that's there won't be used. So at the moment, um, the market signals are driving more imports coming into Scotland and more imports coming in from other countries. Now, we are not, um, you know, uh, the government doesn't oppose uh, more uh, interconnection capacity. We want that to happen. It's something that can bring real benefits to consumers. Um, there's, a, there's an interconnection project that's planned uh, to link from Norway to Scotland as well. Now, that, that potentially has significant consumer benefits for, for Scotland. Um, but that, that will go ahead depending on the economics of that project. So a lot of these things, it's, it's hard to know how things will turn out in the next few years because they're not, they're not driven by a plan. They're literally driven by how the market uh, is evolving. Now, some of the plants that are due to close uh, in England may stay open for longer and they may be to some extent propped up by short-term contracts from National Grid or they get short-term capacity contracts that allows them to, uh, to continue a little bit longer. But it, it's quite hard to get a picture of the, what will happen going much further out because the market is very dynamic uh, and it's not working towards a plan. It's, it's working towards what the economics drive. Yeah. I mean, much, much of that um, power generating capacity south of the border that's due to be closed is going to be replaced by the nu nuclear plants that they're intending to build. And in April, there was press rep reports about a nuclear plant in Normandy, which is similar to the one that's in plan for the UK, which says that there is manufacturing anomalies in components which are particularly important for safety. And I was just wondering, does the Scottish government support the UK government's plans to build new nuclear particularly given, one, the cost to taxpayers or, or bill payers, and, and what concerns does the Scottish Government have about technical problems facing the French nuclear industry and what that might mean for the new nuclear programme? Response to this, if we can. Um, well, there, there is no doubt that the proposed Hinkley Point um, power station is uh, a extremely expensive and more expensive than onshore wind uh, and for a longer period. The subsidies are convenient to last 35 years as opposed to 15 years. And the, a, the headline, uh, a strike price is £92.50, that is index linked, so that will increase. And in addition to that, there's loan guarantees. But on top of all of that, we've got, I think, the case that, uh, as you know, convener, the, of Dex budget of £3 billion, the, over two billion goes for decommissioning costs of nuclear existing nuclear stations, and briefly, uh, for both Flamanville and Okilo Oto, Okilu Oto, in Finland, both of these stations have gone massively over budget, and there are, I think, a treasury source, uh, presumably, a non-official source said over the weekend that consideration has been given to the viability of going ahead with with Hinkley Point, as well as potential challenge from Austria and doubts from the EU. So I think there's quite a few critics of the Hinkley Point project, uh, primarily on the grounds that 
as Peter Atherton said, at £5 million per megawatt of capacity, Hinkley will be, by my reckoning, the most expensive conventional power station in the world. Okay. okay. Um, before I bring in Patrick Harvey, i just briefly follow up on two points. First, on your last point about nuclear, I would simply refer you, Minister, to the evidence we took on the 20th of May from Professor McInnes, Professor Harrison, Professor Bell on whole system costs and how you have to compare uh, base loads from nuclear with uh, intermittent power from wind with the additional cost of backup and storage. But I appreciate these are matters of political debate. But I just wanted to follow up on the question of transmission charges because you mentioned that twice. What, what is the Scottish Government's proposal on transmission charging? Well, um, we have for about a decade, I think, uh, campaign for a fairer regime, a postage stamp regime, where it would be the same throughout the UK, and uh, the former First Minister led that charge. Um, uh, the process was long. In fact, it's, it's taken uh, several years. Uh, but uh, Ofgem, as I think you know, convener, were minded to recommend a, a proposal where there would be um, effectively a reduction of the level of char transmission charges in Scotland. Uh, and we were supportive of that, although we would have liked to have seen it going further. But as you know as well, Convener, that, that uh, decision, which was minded to have been introduced, I think, in April uh, next year or even this year, is now being delayed till at least next year with the possibility of it being further delayed. So uh, I think it is an example of where in the UK the regulatory system has actually failed in just about every respect. The delay, Minister, as you know, is, is there is a judicial review. I think that's the problem. But I'm, I'm glad you've clarified that you seek a, a postage stamp system because we were told on the 3rd of June by, by Ofgem that they looked at a postage stamp system. And one of the reasons they did not pursue that is that they found this would add £7 billion to consumers' bills. Now, in reply to a question from my colleague Dennis Robertson a few moments ago, you were quoting, I think, Keith Anderson from Scottish Power talking about additional costs to the consumer of $2.3 billion. And you said, and I wrote this down, that would not be a sensible or rational decision. And the last time I studied arithmetic, $7 billion was a higher figure than $2.2 or $3 billion. So if it's not sensible or rational to add $2 or $3 billion to consumers' bills, why is it sensible to add $7 billion? Uh, well, as I said, Convener, we, we are supportive of the minded two proposals of Ofgem, which do not produce that extra cost. Uh, but uh, you yourself said, convener, in relation to the transmission charges in Scotland, which is the issue we're talking about, and I believe you said this to BBC Radio on the 17th of February, and I quote, the way the current transmission charging system is set up does discriminate against Long Island, and that's a matter of concern for me. Well, it's a matter of concern for me too, but sadly in the UK, the UK government has chosen to do absolutely nothing about it, and we are mired... To be fair, Minister, that's untrue, because Project Transmit does address these issues and does deliver a substantial cut in transmission charges for Scottish producers. Well, if it comes into effect, but the point I'm making, Convener, is and you're right to say it is subject to judicial review, but it will be too late, won't it? And the UK government, uh, in our invitation to intervene, declined so to do. And, and I think we are in agreement that the charges are discriminatory from a business point of view how can they be anything else? Uh, uh, but uh, we, we have been working with Ofgem and the National Grid, and we were prepared to accept the minded two proposals, which would not have had the effect that you've described. So I, I would dispute your thesis to that extent. OK, and, and my final question on this, because I need to, to, to bring in Patrick Harvey. We also heard uh, from uh, Ofgem that if you move to a postage stamp model, as is your position, as you propose, that would mean an increase in consumer bills in the north of Scotland amongst your constituents and a decrease in consumer bills in the south of England. So your position is that consumers in London should pay less and consumers in the north of Scotland should pay more. Uh, no, that's not our position at all. And uh, that's as you all of Jim claimed the, the, the impact well, of that the postage stamp charging would be. That's not uh, our view. And we, uh, of course, you're not mentioning that there are additional charges that are faced by consumers in the north of Scotland, uniquely in the UK. Uh, something that we have also identified as being unfair. Uh, I, I think the, the bigger picture, convener, is that if the UK government chooses to use the most expensive methods of generate, generating electricity, such as new nuclear, uh, costing, incidentally, uh, a sum which is four times more for one power station, Hinkley Point, four times more 
than the aggregate subsidy for renewables under the first 10 years of its existence. If it chooses to do that, and if it chooses to, instead of using onshore wind, choose more expensive renewable sources, then of course uh, anyone can see that the consumer will have to pay more and pay more unnecessarily. I think we'll go round in circles on, on the uh, respective cost of technology. I'll bring in Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, convener. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to explore some of the demand side uh, issues, which uh, I think it's fair to say there seems to be pretty broad agreement from all of the witnesses that we've heard from that a great deal more needs to be done on demand side management as well as demand reduction overall. Uh, I think it's the view of both governments uh, that a great deal more has to be done in this area and your own opening remarks minister talked about the need for a, a holistic approach to electricity heat transport uh, seeing these as, as part of a, a coherent energy system uh, one of the issues where we uh, already discussed a, 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 a bit of a problem there is for example uh, when the issue of, of solar photovoltaics were, were raised uh, you said that's a matter for another minister. I, I suspect if we looked at the demand side reduction on transport, uh, you would say there's a, the, there's a, a, a balance of, of responsibilities across ministerial portfolios there as well. How does the Scottish Government envisage this debate moving on and achieving that uh, coherent, uh, holistic approach to demand reduction and demand side management uh, across all three of these uh, aspects of our energy system. What what needs to be done to, to get to that point? Well, all, all uh, Scottish Government ministers work uh, together to achieve the objectives of decarbonising our, our uh, means of electricity supply uh, and also tackling energy efficiency, as Mr Harvey rightly says. So we, we work together in these things. Um, the target of reducing total final energy demand is 12% by 2020. Uh, and I think it's reasonable to point out, Convener, that uh, as a practical means of uh, demonstrating our support towards energy efficiency, we have uh, devoted quite a considerable amount of, of money, particularly into helping uh, tenants and homeowners into uh, introducing energy efficiency measures into their own homes, totalling, I believe, around uh, half, uh, half a billion pounds since 2009. And I think that's had broad support across the parties, including from Mr Harvey. So there's a lot more to be done, but uh, all ministers are in the course of doing it. Um, the point about uh, mentioning other ministers in relation to solar uh, panels being put on roofs, it's simply that other ministers are responsible for the public estate, not me. But I, I can assure you that we all work very closely together and, uh, uh, and we meet regularly, such as with myself and Margaret Burgess, to discuss these things. And there is a common will, I think, to achieve the objectives that we, we share in this respect with Mr Harvey. I'm not trying to make a, a combative point at all, uh, but I'm, I'm sure the Minister would recognise that this is a developing agenda. We're not there yet, and I'm, I'm trying to explore what, what direction this debate needs to go in, what more uh, the government feels uh, that it needs to do to develop this agenda, uh, particularly uh, the, the relationship between different government departments. For example, the uh, national uh, infrastructure priority status that's been given to uh, some of the measures on heat will the same approach be taken on electricity and transport? Is that the kind of direction that you envisage this going in the future? Um, I think that's indicative of our broad support across the portfolio areas. I can't really speak for, for my, my colleagues' specific commitments, but certainly um, we've, we, we have come forward with a, a heat plan and a, a network, a programme of delivery of that, quite ambitious targets to... For example, uh, extend the use of district heating across Scotland. This is not particularly the, the topic of this inquiry, perhaps, but as witnesses have pointed out, uh, uh, we are talking about you know four fifths of all energy use in heat in Scotland. So I think it is wrong just to ignore it. Um, so we want to see uh, the progress of uh, of district heating taken forward. I think one of your witnesses also pointed out the waste of the heat that goes into the Forth from Longanet, and quite right so. And uh, you know, the companies in Scotland that I know, like Star Refrigeration, that are taking forward uh, cooling systems. Uh, so that's another area where we need to make progress. A third example, and I'll maybe stop at that with your admonition to be brief, convener, is because uh, there's quite a lot more I can say, but uh, uh, the, the eco, we believe, could be run more effectively from Scotland, and we welcome devolution of powers there in it. In, in relation to that, that matter, which uh, I explored with our, our previous panel, uh, I was, I was keen to see that 
that particular matter put on the, the agenda for, for devolution and I think it, it can hopefully avoid some kind of mismatch uh, when the Scottish Government tries to do more. Do you share my concern that there's still uh, the risk of similar problems arising uh, in the disconnect that can exist between uh, Scottish decision making and UK or GB decision making, whether under the current constitution or uh, a, a GB electricity market that serves independent jurisdictions, uh, that's that's likely to still to have political as well as regulatory decisions made at UK or GB level, uh, which will make it harder to achieve that demand side response uh, agenda when it connects to devolved issues. Uh, what's necessary to achieve that kind of coherence? Uh, I first explored it within the Scottish Government, but, but now between the two governments. Well, I think I can wholeheartedly agree with Mr Harvey that there's a risk of disconnect between the Scottish and the UK governments. Uh, uh, and uh, to, to be serious, Convener, I think there's a concrete example of that, that uh, just last year in, in the autumn, there was a considerable delay in the UK government informing the Scottish government and about the extent and the nature of the announcement about energy efficiency measures and the nature of the budget. There was an announcement made, I think, to a Liberal Democrat Party conference, uh, but the actual details of the amount of money that we were to get and how it would be spent wasn't forthcoming for several weeks thereafter. So there's a risk of disconnect. We try to work constructively with the UK government, but um, but you know, perhaps for the first time, convener, I wholeheartedly agree with Mr Harvey on, on a matter that he's raised. For years it has for me, Minister, but um, the the, the, the opportunity really, whether, regardless of the party politics involved, regardless of the constitutional debate, there is always going to be uh, the danger of decisions at UK or GB level that don't make it easy for us to achieve uh, the kind of things that we're all agreed should be achieved on the demand side in, in Scotland. And I'm trying to get some opportunity to explore solutions to that. How do we oil the wheels a bit. How do we make sure that that works better rather than that we make sure we have opportunities to blame one another for the problems? Well, very, very fair question. I'll, I'll give you what I hope is a, is a constructive and straightforward answer, which is that one of the ways we can do this is, is by working with the UK government on, for example, joint governmental committees. I've suggested today that there should be one for storage and to focus particularly on pump storage. But I would also point out that there has been one convener in relation to the islands. Uh, a onshore, a, the, the islands a, a delivery group to, uh, to, f to devise solutions to connect the Western and Northern Isles to the grid. And that is, I think, is sui generis. I don't think there's any other joint governmental groups on a specific policy project and task. And therefore, without going too much to details of that, the progress that we made in that joint committee would not have been made were there not that joint committee. And that is one of the reasons why I, I made what I hope was a positive suggestion in the opening remarks that the extension of use of joint committees where we work together on serious challenging problems is one of the ways to overcome the risks that I think Mr Harvey, to be serious, quite correctly describes. Just finally, I, I wonder whether you can confirm for me whether or not there's currently a, a, an advisor bringing specific skills and experience to bear on demand-side response uh, on the Scottish Energy Advisory Board, uh, and if not, whether that's something you intend to consider? Uh, well, we have such a vast array of skills and experience, such as in Dr Sweeney, that uh, I, I'm sure we do. But, but uh, to take the question seriously, I will go away, think about that, and I will write to you, convener, to respond to specifically as to whether that is the case. That's helpful. Thank you. OK, okay I appreciate we are behind time, but one, one, one more questioner, uh, Joanne Lemon. Thanks very much. I wonder, um, I mean, I welcome the idea of a joint ministerial group um, between you and the UK government. I wonder whether, as a practical suggestion, a joint ministerial group amongst your own ministers around this particular issue, around um, achieving your targets around climate change, would be really useful. Um, so you don't have to get Mr Lyle to write a letter to the Education Secretary, but you actually do look at things like how do you create incentives for housing associations through funding to look at these areas, if you've got schools getting built, what are we building in at the very early stage to maximise the benefits from that? But I'm interested in just two things briefly. First of all, on the question of... First of all, we all know that the whole question of energy is deeply political. Your government is entirely legitimate to have a position in, on, on nuclear power stations. Other governments will have a, um, a different view. But would you agree with me that 
given the pressure around climate change, none of this can simply on the basis of cost. And when you said that um, it didn't make sense, it was done at a UK level because onshore um, is cheaper, does that mean that it's the position of the Scottish Government to act, to, you would have a presumption in favour of proposals for onshore rather than offshore, because you'll know that for a lot of people, they take the view that we're near capacity on onshore. I don't know if I agree with that, but they want to see offshore being developed. But if your position is simply one of cost, that presumably would have implications for those who want to develop projects offshore. Uh, well, I think there's three questions there. So to be brief, convener, um, we do not consider cost alone. Uh, my opening remarks, I said that we consider the the trilemma, if you like, cost, security of supply, uh, uh, and carbon emissions. So we consider the consumer, we consider the planet, and we consider the practicalities of, uh, of uh, uh, a generation. Uh, secondly, onshore wind, uh, we do not have a presumption uh, of the sort that uh, Joanne Lamont uh, says. Uh, we will only support uh, wind farms appropriately cited. The process for that is one with which members will be familiar. Uh, but it is a robust process that is taken extremely seriously uh, and uh, therefore um, all decisions are made entirely on their merits. And that is also the case with offshore and indeed any other ministerial decisions that have to be taken under Section 36 of the Energy Act. The last point I would say is we already have a, a grouping of ministers. It's called the uh, Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change and it's doing its work uh, reasonably well. And I can assure Joanne Lamont, as she will know from her time in ministerial office, that there is very close... Uh, close cooperation between ministers in every conceivable uh, means of communication and regularly do I meet Margaret Burgess in particular to discuss these matters and we will continue so to do. Can I also, um, I want to talk just a bit about this issue about the security of supply because uh, Dr Sweeney says it's not simply a technical issue. Um, if you were to take the view that it simply is a technical issue which can be addressed, which is I think the view I would take, um, would you share the concerns of some people who have come to the committee who believe that the whole question of security of supply inhibits us in going full throttle for renewable uh, developments? Um, well, I'm not quite, I apologise, I'm just not quite sure of the point that Joanne Laman is making. I want to try to answer the question. I don't know if you want to rephrase it. That the danger is that if you accept it's more than simply a technical issue to be sorted, you, you create a bit of paralysis around the system. So we, we, will need to, we need to continue getting all of this balance right. We'll need to import certain amounts or whatever. And it's inhibiting the development of real renewable options. No, I, I don't think I agree with that. It's a bit of a, I mean, I can see the theory, but I think the practice at the moment is that the risk to developing further renewable capacity is one, we don't know what the long-term target is because the UK government haven't said so. They haven't committed to a decarb target by 2030. And two, uh, we don't know what the announcement is going to be with regard to onshore, although we, we are advised that there's likely to be one. And three, this is causing commercial mayhem and uh, grave concern amongst communities in Scotland as we speak. So I think that, convener, is the greatest source of uncertainty. Uh, and I may say it's arisen after a very brief period of certainty there was a hiatus of certainty amidst the huge, huge uh, uh, periods of uncertainty when EMR was being devised. We thought that was over, but now it's been reintroduced by the UK government's uh, decision floated in the, in the newspapers. Uh, and we, we uh, just hope that they will listen to voices of communities, consumers and companies uh, and, uh, and reflect those views in any decision that they may take. And, and what do you think the Scottish Government can do to address this sense that people have around the question of security of supply, that renewables, taking a renewables approach is unreliable and that we might you know, see the lights going off and we therefore need to think about how we're going to uh, manage all of that. I mean, it does feel to me that potentially there may be those with an interest in a matter who, in whose interest it is to talk up uncertainty. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, as, as I've always said, I think there needs to be a variety of meeting uh, our electricity needs, a variety of sources of generation. Uh, the nature of that variety will change from fossil fuels to various different types of renewables. Uh, we do undoubtedly need more storage solutions to counteract the intermittency of, uh, of renewables. That's, that's why we have been arguing the case for several years. Uh, uh, and uh, from an operator's point of view, the National Grid are perfectly happy with and very enthusiastic about onshore wind. 
uh, I, as I learned when I visited the headquarters uh, some time ago to educate myself about how they, how they actually operated the grid. So, yes, I do agree with Joanne Lamont that there is some public disquiet about that, perhaps stimulated by uh, some overexcited news coverage, but uh, uh, the operators, the people who actually work in the industry, recognise the enormous value of renewable energy and the Scottish Government will press on with our ambitious vision for Scotland as a renewable powerhouse of, uh, of the UK and, indeed, Europe. And you would prefer not to be um, managing any sense of security of supply from uh, nuclear energy? Uh, well, I've made a, a, a different kind of range of topic, convener, but perfectly happy to answer that, as I have done before on many occasions. Uh, we don't believe that new nuclear power stations uh, are the right way ahead for various reasons, including costs that I've covered, uh, particularly the enormous cost of decommissioning, which I hope the committee will look at in its report, because they are truly mind-boggling and account for, I think, about two-thirds of DEC's budget per annum, actually, although maybe you could check that. But, uh, but as far as the existing power stations go, we have Hunterston and Torness. Uh, they have been very well managed and, and uh, run over the years, and uh, one of them has had a life extension, the other, we expect, will have a life extension possibly to 2.30 at Torness, Hunterston 2.23. I think those are the, the dates that are in my mind. So they will be generating for some time to come. And after all the money has been sunk and invested in nuclear power stations, it is sensible for them to operate safely and provide electricity needs, particularly when we're in danger of losing further thermal generation from coal. So I think that's a pragmatic approach that we have adopted regarding a nuclear and a, a principled one, but we are on a transmission, a, a transition to a, a to meeting our energy, electricity needs from uh, more renewable sources, uh, and that is the direction that we will continue to travel in Scotland and seeking to work constructively with the UK government towards that end. Okay. Um, I think that concludes us. I'm sorry we're a little bit over time, Minister. Um, I thank you for your time this morning. Thank you to your officials. And the committee will now go into private session.